Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider does. Spins a web any size. No, he can't. He's a pig. Sorry, we're not that good at rhyme. Hyper, Benny, thought I told you guys to get ready for Spider Month. Oh, we are, darling. Yeah, we're ready to mock the hell out of those Sam Raimi movies. Awesome, I think. Wait, I thought you guys loved the Raimi movies. I mean, I've made fun of them for years, but you two have always defended them. That's one of the reasons I brought you in, to get a different point of view. Oh, that's when we were children, darling. Little babies. Oh. Yeah, we've grown a lot since then. As you can tell by our grow-upping demeanor. Oh, really? So now you see them as silly movies? Oh, of course, darling. The Raimi films are ridiculous. Laughably ridiculous. That's so funny. I've been saying that for years, and everybody's been looking at me like I was crazy. They are awful. Simply the worst kind of awful. Well, I don't know if I go that far. Now that we have real Spider-Man movies. As well as real comic book movies in general. We've been enlightened with age, and now we see them for the shit that they really are. Well, I wouldn't call them shit. What are you talking about? You've mocked them more than anyone, darling. I know, but I guess I've always had a bit of a soft spot for them. Gas! Are you saying you actually like those baby movies? Yes. I mean, no. I mean, I don't know. Compared to the millions of other comic book movies we have now, they are kind of unique. Looks like he's one of those man-children that can't let go of his happy memories. <laughs> hey, there is good money to be made with that. I mean, I was telling you guys these movies were silly. You obviously haven't matured like we have. Come, dear. Let us venture to where the adults are. Joke's on you. You're on the internet. A mental fountain of youth. Nobody grows up here! Am I really gonna end up defending these movies? There's an interesting backlash that's been going on with the Sam Raimi films as well as the Mark Webb films. In honor of Spider Month, we're gonna look at both of these series, but for now, let's start with the Sam Raimi movies. In the past, they were mostly well received, gaining praise from critics and audiences, and even hailed as trailblazing groundbreakers. With the release of even bigger fan favorites though, like the MCU Spider-Man films and even the Oscar winning Into the Spider-Verse, many are looking back at these and seeing them as, well, corny. It's a Norman Rockwell type of superhero light, goofy, and living in a romanticized universe. No playing in the streets. Yes, Mr. Spider-Man. Don't get me wrong, the first two Superman movies do the same thing and they're hailed as some of the best comic book films ever made. But how do I put this? If Superman is the murder in Mississippi of Norman Rockwell's work, Spider-Man is the after the prom of Norman Rockwell's work. The Supermans could get really intense, morally difficult, and epically powerful. Kids could watch them, but they were mostly for adults. The Spider-Mans were occasionally emotional, but leaned more towards non-threatening imagery and ideas. I still have no idea why this movie is PG-13. Was it this look? Cover your children's eyes! The Spider-Man comics could be goofy too, but they didn't shy away from dark choices and heavy themes. Treated with as much seriousness as possible. These... Are you in, or are you out? It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. Do seem to be more kid-focused, don't they? But with all that said, this is a very unique universe I don't see much in comic book movies. There's tons of films like Batman, there's tons of films like Iron Man, but with Spider-Man? Nobody really talks like they talk here. Nobody really acts like how these characters act. Nobody lives in such a friendly yet odd environment. It's like if Pleasantville had pumpkin bombs right down to Tobey Maguire's in both of them. But the question remains, does that make these good films or bad films? Oh, like you even have to ask, darling. You know, I think I can handle this without you adults, so piss off! Come, darling. Let us snort our way out of here. <sighs> The best way to figure this out is to look at all the films in order, beginning with the original Spider-Man. In production hell for years, Spider-Man was handed from creator to creator trying to bring it to the big screen, with one of the biggest names being James Cameron. But like most things he holds off on, he just kind of gave it to someone else. After proving he could make continuous good movies with a strange, dark edge to them, Sam Raimi was finally given the reins for the project, being a gigantic Spider-Man fan himself. Now keep in mind, comic book movies were mostly seen as box office poison at the time. So this was a bit of a risk. However, there was a holy trinity in the late 90s and early 2000s that changed people's minds. Blade, X-Men, and this. This, very 
very clearly was the biggest hit out of all of them, and many claim got the ball rolling for comic book movies to be the cinematic empire they are now. So this film is owed a lot of things. But, as we asked before, does it still hold up 18 years after it came out? And can the people who grew up with it still find appreciation in its... bizarreness? Well, I imagine that might be harder for some than others. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Spider-Man. After the opening credits to the Spider-Man video game... No, really, tell me you couldn't see this in there. Help! Please! I'm going to die! We get a narration from Peter Parker, played with mild disinterest by Tobey Maguire. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. Let it be known the third line of this movie has faint of heart used unironically. If you're really surprised by anything awkward that follows, you can't say they didn't warn you. We see Parker chasing the school bus as it appears he's so geeky, even geeks won't let him sit next to them. Mm -mm. Don't even think about it. God, it's like a POV cam from when I was in high school. I mean, uh, let's look at my yearbook picture again. They go on a field trip with a pretty fucking weird teacher, even as these movies go. You were talking throughout that woman's entire presentation. What is going on? Let's go talk about how we listen. The next person who talks will fail this course. I kid you not. Daniel, how many times have I told you students can't teach the class? Peter's best friend Harry, played by James Franco, is dropped off by his controlling father, Norman Osborn, played by Willem Dafoe, playing Christopher Walken. Somebody there? Who is this? I can't. What? I started this. I'll make a few calls. How come I never see these two in the same room? Goblish Moblin, this is the real villain alter ego story! I just don't know who's supposed to be the villain and who's supposed to be the normal one. Your parents must be very proud. I think he wants to adopt you. <laughs> They're taken to a lab where genetically designed super spiders, and yes, that is the scientific term. Genetically designed super spiders. We try to name our species by what looks good on a B-movie poster. As Peter continues to be picked on. For the school paper? Mm -hmm. Well, that helps me. My article's on logs. Peter tries hitting on Mary Jane, played by Kirsten Dunst, asking if he can take her picture. I need one with a student in it. Don't make me look ugly. That's impossible. <gasps> Now, for a long time, I didn't really get what Mary Jane was about, as she was just sort of written as... nice. I think Dunst had the same issue, because she looks like she has no idea what to do with this character, aside from being... nice. When I read more Spider-Man comics, though, I found she's supposed to be more of an energized extrovert. Kinda like Rogue from X-Men, or Andrea Beaumont from Mask of the Phantasm, or... Honestly, Kirsten Dunst from Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So she can clearly play this role of someone that has a tough life, but puts that energy into being super active and positive. Here, we got the tough life part down, but every scene it looks like she's praying, nay, pleading for direction about what her character is supposed to be, as she's running out of ways of just being... nice! Terry, relax. You'll think I'm a stupid little girl with a crush. I'd like a cheeseburger. No, I, I guess not. You are amazing. I'm in love with somebody else. I want to act. Somebody, please. There's only so long I can smile like a sitcom wife who's dead inside. While taking her picture, Peter gets bitten by an escaped spider. Subtle. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, at Oscorp, Norman is showing the military his new glider technology. <laughs> Complete with Krang's body. But it's Oscorp's other experiments that pique the military's interest. Human performance enhancers. We tried vapor inhalation with rodent subjects. What were the side effects? Violence, aggression, and insanity. Okay, screw the rest of the movie. I want to see what an insane mouse looks like. Does it do cartwheels? Does it eat its own hand? Why watch these goofballs when we could be seeing this the whole time? You are the syphilis uh, to everything I've worked so hard for, you miserable, poisonous sack of disease. But brain! Shut it, bitch! Uh. The military tells Oscorp if they can't produce successful human trials or non-crazy rats, they're going to give funding to another company. Meanwhile, Peter makes it home to his Aunt May and Uncle Ben, feeling the effects of the spider bite. You won't have a bite? No thanks. Had a bite. What's that all about? Maybe our wallpaper's making him sick again. Why did we go at VeggieTales' funeral? Peter begins to transform as that seems to be the pattern tonight with Norman using himself as the human trial. We'll have lost the contract to Quest and Oscorp will be dead. Get me the Promochloroparazine. We will perfect the ultimate mouthwash. 
dick. He's exposed to all his farts from the lighthouse, causing him to go insane, killing his partner. Meanwhile, Peter, through spider science, seems to wake up cool. Oh, creepy boy with his room window staring right at his high school crush. I think those hands were hairy and wet long before that spider ever bit him. Hey, Michelangelo, don't forget we're painting the kitchen right after school, got it? Don't start without me. And don't start up with me. Hey, I don't have a prayer to survive this film, do I? No, dear. At school, Peter discovers he has amazing abilities, and Mary Jane discovers she can't even have lunch without having to be rescued. Now, apparently this wasn't CGI, and it took 156 takes to finally get this right. But I don't know, if that were true, I think the reaction would be less this. Wow. And more this. <sighs> 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 That was pure luck! I was not in control of that situation at all! <laughs> he continues to go through spider puberty as he can't talk to girls while goose pews out of him, and things get messy without having any control. Uh, kids, if you're gonna have children, they're the best kind to have. Peter leaves school and discovers even more abilities on the rooftops. To those wondering if these hideous effects look good back then, Lord of the Rings The Two Towers came out the exact same year. These effects were awful! But don't worry, as the film goes on, they get... These effects were awful! Up, up, and away, web! Peter tries summoning his web again, but can't seem to recreate it. Fly! Shazam! Go, web, go! Maybe if I think of banging Mary Jane... There we go! I like where he lands on the ad, similar to how a bug would land on a windshield. But the fun stops when he realizes he forgot to get home in time to paint the kitchen. Uh, Uncle Ben's drunk again. Oh. It looks like Mary Jane's father is yelling at her, which might be why this awkward romantic scene comes across like two six-year-olds acting in a school play. You can just see what's coming. And what for me? You're gonna line up Broadway. You're taller than you look. I hunch. Don't. Honey, what are you doing? I'm writing the Spider-Man movie. Well, stop hunching over. You're gonna ruin your posture. Just let me work. Great, I wrote that into the script. Who cares? Nobody's gonna listen to the romance in Spider-Man. But whatever you want, as long as there's nice music. I guess that's true. I'm gonna go back to helping George Lucas write the Star Wars prequels. Hey! How many times have I told you not to track sand in the house? It's coarse, rough, and it gets everywhere! Peter decides to look for ways to get money to buy a car to impress Mary Jane. He notices an ad for amateur wrestlers, because the paper's printing Craigslist now. And he asks Uncle Ben if he can drop him off, saying he's gonna study at the library. Now we all know this scene, Uncle Ben says with great power, yada yada yada. Peter blows him off and he's gonna regret it. But honestly, I would have liked a little more friction between them as Peter kinda bites his head off out of nowhere. It's not like there was a falling out between them earlier on. He just kind of acts mean for the sake of acting mean. I'll figure it out. Stop lecturing me, please. I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. Or at least tell me where my father is. Never. He knows what he did even if I forgot. God damn you, Uncle Ben. He goes to the wrestling ring. Wait, wrestling is real in this universe? Now I know this isn't reality. As he applies to fight. Hey, I thought Octavius wasn't in this. Down the hall to the ramp. May God be with you. Don't forget to try my pie. It's shit. The Amazing Spider-Man! The announcer sends Peter into the ring to fight a wrestler named Bonesaw. And I'm not gonna lie, seeing Randy Savage, Bruce Campbell, and Octavia Spencer seconds apart in a wrestling ring kinda makes me think there's a god. Randomness like that has to be planned. Hey, it's how the internet reacted when they heard Maguire was cast in the role. Don't worry, a treasure trove of memes shall be thine reward. Bonesaw's gonna eat you up and Actually, this is the most attention I've gotten from women, thank you. Hey, Freak Joe, you're going nowhere. I got you for three minutes of beat time. Can I bring up it's been over nine years since he passed and I still miss the shit out of this guy? Snap into a Spider-Man! Oh. 
After honestly a really great action sequence, probably my favorite in the movie, which is a weird problem, but we'll get to that. Peter doesn't get all his money because he defeated him too early. I need that money. I missed the part where that's my problem. Ooh, another possible reason this was PG-13. Avert your eyes! It's as much skin as the Little Mermaid shows! The manager gets mugged though, running past Peter, who gets out of his way. Thanks! What the hell's the matter with you? You let him go! Well, as a security guard, we always advise kids to stop armed men. Idiot! You could have taken that guy apart. I missed the part where that's my problem. Peter discovers though that Uncle Ben's car has been stolen and he was shot in the process. Uncle Ben? Oh my god, you've been shot! I missed the part where that's my problem. Peter. Finish painting the kitchen. Uncle Ben dies, unleashing his spider rage. Let's see, what'd he tell me again? I wasn't listening. With great power comes great vengeance. Lots of vengeance. Good advice, Uncle Ben! So the effects here are pretty hit and miss, with sometimes them looking pretty smooth, and other times looking like the 90s cartoon with five pairs of sunglasses on. thing is, a lot of this sequence is hard to see, but the part you're supposed to not see, the carjacker's face, is clearly shown in a number of different shots. Oh my god, it's you! I only had 12 opportunities to notice that! Thank god for that flashback! Who has time to remember minutes ago?! You know what I love about heroes that don't kill? Bad guys always conveniently trip to their deaths around them. I had a partner, by the way, and I'm important. Can you believe about Uncle Ben? I know Aunt May, he's dead. No, I meant we're out of Uncle Ben Rice. Where's my husband? Meanwhile, a nearby base is testing their vibrator grasshopper when Norman crashes the party. <laughs> that seems how a general would react. No duck and cover or locate any weapons. Just tell my wife I died not screaming like my wife. Cut to everybody graduating as Norman seems to be happier for Peter than he is for his own son. I know this has been a difficult time for you. Excuse me, I have a tumor to fill with this pent-up aggression. If you ever need anything, just give me a call. You're like a brother to Harry. That makes you family. You're like a brother I wish my son had. Minus my son. Spontaneously cut to Peter crying. Trust me, you'll get used to that. As he admits he was thinking about Uncle Ben. Get used to that too. You were meant for great things. You won't disappoint him. Unless you give a really weak entrance by awkwardly walking by papers, barely showing your mask when you had an epic World Trade Center intro from the teaser ready to go. Yeah, Batman shows his wings, Superman flies, Spider-Man judges you like you ate his McGriddle. Spider epic! Yeah, this scene from the teaser was clearly meant to start this montage off, but it was cut due to 9-11. They have a second of it in there, but it's played so fast without the original buildup that if you blink, you miss it. It's super weak, allowing us to focus on how kind of weird a lot of these New Yorkers are. Even by New Yorker standards. He stinks and I don't like it. Ah, some kind of freaky Lewis something. Whack a do. Whack a do! Taking yous in the thirst bucket to the stoop to get the pie! Get a load of this! <laughs> What, were Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable robbing a place? Guy with eight hands. Sounds hot. I am 100% digging this Xena reboot. The blonde looks great. He has those tights and that tight little... Whoa, watch it. This is a PG-13. You can't say... Backside. Excuse me, darling, but it seems like you find this movie rather ridiculous. Well, yeah, I never said it wasn't, but I am still... Invested enough? Oh yeah, that's a quote for the movie. Spider-Man, I was invested enough. You know, you're making my job of praising a movie I said was overpraised very difficult. Well, well that's what happens when you're a grown-up. I will prove to you there is something beneficial here for adults. You do that while we continue being adults. Uh, come, darling, let's use our free time discussing how there's no free time. Oh, that's very adult. Rather! People need to die younger. Hey, you can see us at Midwest Gaming Classic in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, April 3rd to the 5th. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitch, Monday through Saturday. Playing a lot of games, telling a lot of jokes, and having a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. So 
the one over-the-top element everyone can seem to get behind in these movies is J.K. Simmons as J. Jonas Jameson. He's the fast-talking head of the Daily Bugle, and despite him really having no reason to hate Spider-Man, he does it so well, I don't think anybody cares. Tomorrow morning, Spider-Man, page one with a decent picture this time. Move Conway to page seven. There's a problem with page seven. I make it page eight and give him 10% off. Okay. I make it 5%. That can't be done. Get out of here! How's this for a story? Kids today don't even know what newspapers are! Peter bumps into Mary Jane and discovers she's dating Harry. But Harry hasn't brought this up to Peter despite them living together. Hey Pete, you're probably looking for a job. Dad, maybe you can help him out. Oh! <laughs> No, I, I appreciate it. Peter discovers he could get a job taking pictures of Spider-Man, so he sets up cameras hoping a crime will conveniently happen in front of them. So, you're Spider-Man. Maybe you 300. That's a standard freelance fee. Peter takes the check to Betty, played by Elizabeth Banks, who welcomes him to the Daily Bugle. Welcome to the Daily Bugle. Thank you. My wig has a good feeling about you, but it's also advising me to direct Charlie's Angels. At Oscorp, Norman seems to be top of the world, sending the business to new heights. So of course he's fired. You're out, Norman. Norman tries getting revenge at a Raise Awareness for Better Balloon Effects festival, starring 2002's most 2002 performer, Macy Gray. Why didn't you wear the black dress? Just, I wanted to impress my father. He loves black. Well, maybe he'll be impressed no matter what. Twitter's gonna freak if they see you wearing that. James Franco's audition to play Tommy Wiseau in three, two, Oh, hi, Mr. Fargus. Norman finally reveals himself to the world as the Green Goblin, and... It's just as dumb looking as you remember it. Hello, my dear. Now, I'm not gonna pretend this is an easy character to bring into a three-dimensional world, but... Look at these other concepts. When you see what we could have gotten, it hits you even more how... Pez dispensary he looks. Don't get much better when Spider-Man arrives. I mean, they do, just not in the way I think the movie intends. This action sequence, after not having watched it for years, is one of the craziest goddamn things I've ever seen. Just look at this as an adult, with the weird imagery, shitty effects, and over-the-top acting, and tell me this isn't a drunken Power Ranger battle. Everything about it is totally insane! Look at this kid. Did he get high before coming there? What kind of expression is that? Why doesn't his mom just grab him? He's right there. Is that balloon moving backwards the fuck? Why does this girl act like she's in a Mentos commercial? It's Spider-Man! The Fresh Maker. Impressive! What, talking without your lips moving? <laughs> that fucker's dead. Jesus, that looks awful. Did we even get a shot of Spider-Man standing up seeing the goblin coming towards him? We just cut to him running like a stunt show. Did they fast forward Mary Jane? What are they doing? Jesus, that looks awful. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> we'll meet again, Spider-Man! Did he just pull a- I'll get you next time, Gadget. Is that a dummy or did he die in midair? Why was it hard to get a person in a spider suit to hold her? Don't mind us, she just needs to use the elevator. Ha uh ha? -huh. So as you can see, this entire action sequence is completely nuts. But because of that, it's kind of amazing. I give it three and a half little WTFs. Yay! Norman begins realizing he may have a split personality. At least that's what the voice in his head is telling him. This is scene chewing at its yummiest. So many good things all happening for you. All for you. I'm beginning to think you hate glass more than Spider-Man. Is this like your number one fear? Bringing you what you've always wanted. There's only one who can stop us. <laughs> that moment you realize he was actually underperforming when he played Nosferatu. Norman goes to the Daily Bugle to find Spider-Man's photographer. Jameson, <gasps> you slime! Slime? Oh, chalk that up to another reason this would PG-13! Who's the photographer who takes the pictures of Spider-Man? I don't know who he is. His stuff comes in the mail. You're lying! I swear! So Jameson's willing to put his life on the line for Parker? That's like Bluto sticking his neck out for Popeye. It's possible, but you gotta explain it. Spider-Man appears, but Goblin has a way to knock him out. Oh, I do hope it's a silly way. Sleep! <laughs> I love it when it hits you that the main villain of your movie just made a Humphrey the Bear sound effect. <laughs>
Goblin paralyzes Spider-Man and offers him a chance to join Goblin in... Being crazy! You and I are not so different. I'm not like you. Eventually they will hate you. Why bother? Because it's right. And other cliche lines from the 40s, why doesn't he take his mask off? I mean, he tells him to think about his offer, but why doesn't he just take Spider-Man's mask off to see who he is? I could take your mask off right now. I know, but don't. But I want to. I don't want you to. But I could. But you won't. Why? Chicken thigh. Well, I guess you got me there! After that, we get, ooh, another scene where Peter and Mary just talk. I do hope it feels more like status updates than actual conversation. How's it going with you? Why so interested? I'm not. You're not? Well, why would I be? I don't know. Why would you be? I don't know. What the hell are you even talking about? I'm not. You're not? Well, why would I be? Why would you be? You're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No, it's because I'm so in love with you. Mary Jane has to be rescued again, this time from kissy faces. Ooh, I saw a hoodlum do that in West Side Story. <laughs> and I've never seen anyone do that. But Peter changes into Spider-Man to save her. You have a knack for saving my life. I think I have a superhero stalker. Who talks like that? You know, Peter, she doesn't know you're Spider-Man. There's no red flags that she's cheating on her boyfriend with a pajama criminal while also kind of playing the field with you. This is why all you got was a hug in Spider-Man 3. The next day, we continue our pattern of parents who are awful as a mother leaves her baby in a burning building. Yep, Spider-Man's gonna die in a burning building with a baby. This movie suddenly got super dark on a whim. Well, that was suspenseful. They hear another woman screaming inside, only to discover it's the goblin. What about my generous proposal? Are you in or are you out? It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. That line's like a pendulum. The more it repeats, the more you die a little. They fight in the fire with Spider-Man getting his arm injured, but both of them flee, just in time for turkey. Yeah, I'm tired of nobody putting this on their favorite Thanksgiving specials. Norman, will you do the honors? Spider-Man, where even sampling sweet potatoes is somehow made weird. Norman notices Peter's wound and immediately figures out he's Spider-Man. Shocking, he kept it a secret so well. Something has come to my attention. And just when you think this movie can't be any more... What? What do I do? Instruct him in the matters of loss. <laughs> but how? The cunning warrior attacks neither body nor mind. I just recently saw David Lynch interrogate a monkey. This is weirder. Can you imagine somebody walking in on this supposed intimidating scene and not laughing their ass off? Hey Rob, I wanted to get your input on... What must I do? Nope, I have to look again. <laughs> this leads to, believe it or not, an even crazier ass scene when he crashes in on a praying Aunt May. <laughs> Oh my god! You can't see anything like this in another comic book movie. It is so precisely odd. I want to see him do this for other things that people should wrap up. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me. Finish it! For me! Finish it! For me! <laughs> She's sent to the hospital where, oh yes! Peter and Mary Jane remain perfectly still in one spot talking again! You know, there's other romantic things you can do! Go to the fair, walk on the beach, not say things in such a creepy-ass manner. You feel excited, and at the same time, terrified. Call the police. Harry sees Mary Jane flirting with Peter, though, and goes to tell his daddy. I haven't always been there for you, have I? 
I've lost sight of that somewhere, but I gotta make it up to you, Harry. I'm going to rectify certain inequities. Good to have you back, Dad. This wasn't cryptic at all. Ah! Wake up, little spider. Wake up. Eek. Peter wakes up from his terrifying dream, as it seems Aunt May is doing better. You do too much. You're not Superman, you know. <laughs> well, I'd have to get a lot better at breaking necks. You know, you were about six years old when MJ's family moved in. You grabbed me and said, Aunt May? Aunt May? Is that an angel? I really don't like how many parallels this has to the prequels. Aunt May says everyone knows he's in love with Mary Jane, which gets him thinking he should give her a call. Hi. Hey, see. MJ. I need to know if you're an angel. Hello? <laughs> MJ, you're finally laughing at my jokes. It looks like the goblin has kidnapped Mary Jane as well as a car full of kids. You can tell they were saving the really good effects for the climax here. Same year as Gollum! This is why only fools are heroes. Yeah. Spider-Man shows up as Goblin forces him to choose between Mary Jane or the children. Now, anyone who knows the comics knows this is a send-up to when the Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy on the Brooklyn Bridge. One of the most shocking deaths in comic book history. But here? Eh, we're just gonna do the Batman for everything. Cause you know, if you're gonna steal from Batman, might as well be the best one. It's not that they don't kill Mary Jane, I honestly don't think that would have worked here. It's that there's no point in doing it like this if you're not going to deliver the goods. It'd be like telling the story of Jesus. He heals people, gets to the trial, and then he's found innocent and goes home. There's kind of some big epic stuff you're leaving out. Oh yeah, did I mention this was made right after 9-11? Leave Spider-Man alone! You gotta pick on a guy trying to save a bunch of kids! You mess with me, you mess with New York! You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! God bless you, your heart's in the right place. <laughs> Spider-Man saves Mary Jane and the kids, but the goblin grabs him and takes him to, honestly, the second best fight in the movie. Again, I think that's because there's not a lot of half-ass CGI and it feels more gritty and grounded. It's even one of the few times the goblin's mask looks pretty cool. As you can see, Defoe's much scarier teeth inside the fake teeth, giving it a nice creepy vibe. As you'd imagine, Spider-Man finds his strength and ends up beating the Goblin, just as he reveals his identity. Give me your hand. I've been like a father to you. You know, a father that tries to kill everything you know and love? A Hollywood father. I have a father. His name was Ben Parker. Yeah, and I'm Ray Skywalker. We really are who we choose to be, aren't we? He accidentally nails himself and his goblins as he makes one last request to Peter. Don't tell Harry. Well, I guess you did try to kill my girlfriend and Aunt May and me. You know, fuck you, I'm telling Harry. No, I guess he keeps his dumb scouts on her and returns Norman home where Harry finds him. I'm so sorry, Harry. I swear on my father's grave, Spider-Man will pay. You know, the word on the street is the X-Men did this. That Dazzler's a real psycho. Well, here we are at the funeral of our best friend's father. Wanna go out? There's something I've been wanting to tell you. When I was up there, there was only one person who I was thinking of. The person I've stood still and talked five times having the most boring of conversations with! It's love! Dull, monotonous love! I love you so much, Peter. But Peter, in order to keep her safe, turns down her advances. Because that's totally how it's always gonna be, guys. I will always be your friend. Only your friend? That's all I have to give. <laughs> Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. Bros before hoes. With great power comes great responsibility. He swings towards an amazingly convincing American flag that totally wasn't put in at the last minute. And that's the end of Spider-Man. It certainly is. Uh, so, Critic, with all the jokes and mockery you made of this movie, has anything changed for you since you last saw it? <sighs> yeah, but... It hasn't just changed for me, it's changed for you too. Oh yeah? What's that? Comic book movies. You see, back then there weren't that many, and I was waiting for the equivalent of The Dark Knight to come out, something that took comic book films super seriously. Instead, I got this, something silly, over the top, and mostly innocent. So I always kind of resented it, thinking we could get a much more serious Spider-Man movie. 
But now that we have films like The Dark Knight and even more serious Spider-Man movies, I can finally enjoy how one of a kind this series is. But it's so ridiculous! Yeah, everything in it is so campy and goofball. But that's part of the fun. Its cons are also its pros. If you don't take it that seriously and just embrace the hilariously sugar-coated world, it is kind of fun. It's paced well, it's a decently laid out origin story, and its angles and imagery are very old school comic book. I know it takes liberties, but if you compare it to the liberties other comic book movies took at the time, this one actually stayed closer than others. And yes, this was the movie that arguably made the biggest impact in getting comic book films going again. And for that to be an innocent, gentle, cornball flick instead of an extreme, dark, hardcore bloodfest, it's actually rather impressive. It's funny, a lot of younger people that grew up with this find themselves disliking it as they get older. But since I watched it with a more cynical mind and the cinematic environment around me has changed, I actually find myself enjoying it. If I focus on the passion and creativity rather than the details. I think this movie's gonna have a different reaction with different ages at different times. And you know what? If it broadens your point of view, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, there it is. Yes, there it is. So, do we like this movie or not? Well, I guess the little kid in me is always going to like it, and the adult in me is always going to find problems with it, darling. And the good news is, there's nothing wrong with that. Whatever you feel towards a movie is okay to feel. Well, I guess we were trying to grow up a bit too fast. Oh, come on, Benny, let's put on our Spider-Man pajamas and watch the Raimi films again. With alcohol. Oh yeah, of course with alcohol. We have to enjoy some perks of adulthood. There's nothing even in these goddamn things. I'm not a nostalgia critic, and whether sober or plastered, Spider Month is just beginning! <laughs>
everybody gets one. Yes, Mr. Spider-Man. This, of course, makes Peter late for his delivery, causing him to lose his job. Well, give me another chance. Again, tone set. That is both kind of sad, but really funny at the same time. This bizarre world feels so much more embraced than before. The only thing to cement it is... Get your pretty little portfolio off my desk before I go into a diabetic coma. You are proof cloning will continue, because when you die, we're still gonna have you on the roll. I don't think this covers the advance I gave you a couple weeks ago. Hey, chin up, okay? If I can survive being Rita Repulsa, you can survive this. Maybe another reason I like this movie is I get to see Maguire endlessly tortured. It's like this movie is a Toby sadist, and I'm very okay with that. Dr. Connors! Your grades have been steadily declining. You're late for class. You're forgetting to utilize me until the reboot? Not cool. Peter goes to Aunt May, who planned a surprise birthday party inviting all his friends. Both of them. We're about to make a breakthrough infusion. Your father would be so proud, rest his soul. What was his cause of death again? Well, my butler who tended his wounds said giant knife to the ball. From Spider-Man? Well, unless he's leaving out some crucial information, I'm making that assumption, yes. In one of my favorite lines that I'm not sure was intentional, Aunt May wakes up dreaming Uncle Ben is still alive. She clarifies everybody is gone, I'm sure referring to the party, but with Rosemary Harris being such a good actress, you get the feeling she could be talking about all the people in her life. Oh, for a second there, I thought I was years ago. Everybody's gone, aren't they? Did they have a good time? I'm sure they did. Even when you're not trying, you're being emotional. It's just that I miss your Uncle Ben so much. Were I to face the one responsible for what happened, I'd... I'd probably give him the silent treatment and then start a garage sale. I am loopy. I also like Peter and Mary Jane recreating their talk in the backyard. And again, the dialogue seems a bit more genuine this time instead of just quoting cheesy one-liners at each other. For the most part, she tries hitting on him, he turns her down, and then she says she's seeing someone else. Leading to this weird line. I'm seeing somebody now. Oh, therapy. How would you take that? A person, a man. <laughs> so it's like therapy, but with sex and dinner. And I obsess over you and both. Parker sneaks into his apartment, trying to hide from his landlord and daughter so he can delay paying the rent. Hi. What's hi? Can I spend it? Hi, Pete. Oh. I'm just gonna say it. These two are my favorite characters in all the movies. Promise. If promises were crackers, my daughter would be fat. <laughs> I want a sitcom where they own a building, all the tenants are superheroes, and they never realize it. If that can become a show, why not this? Get on it! Peter visits Dr. Octavius, played by Alfred Molina, who's working on a groundbreaking project under Harry at Oscorp. But he's heard of Peter's infamous laziness. You well, know, being brilliant's not enough, young man. Intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift, and you use it for the good of mankind. Like a co-worker of mine once said, with great power comes great Oh, come on! They do get along, though, as Peter is fascinated by the possibility of Octavius creating the power of the sun but he has a fear he might have miscalculated. Are you sure you could stabilize the fusion reaction? Rosie, our new friend thinks I'm gonna blow up the city. I'm just saying I know scientists who turned into goblin people carry the one. I mean what I said when I mentioned this movie got more realistic dialogue. It just happens to be for a Frank Capra flick. But if you want to get a woman to fall in love with you, feed her poetry. Poetry? Never fails. If that doesn't work, try some marshmallow rice squares. Those are swell. Peter decides to see Mary Jane's play, but once again, he gets sidetracked by Spider-Man problems. Yeah, if there's anything I know, New York on a weekend evening is always traffic-free for a car chase. I should point out that the effects in this film are a lot better. Even when they look a little fake, they're still clever and ambitious. Which is more than I can say for some of the extras? It's a web. Go, Spidey, go! Cut! Do we have time to do a take two? No. Great job, totally convincing. Glad to see that fired wrestling announcer got another job. No one will be seated after the doors are closed. It helps maintain the illusion. I wonder if that's a clue to him one day playing Mysterio. Oh, God. Jesus, struck a nerve. Spider-Man, a Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can, a spins away. Um, racist? I don't know. I watch Fresh Off the Boat, I think that balances me out. Parker finds his spidey powers are fading away though, forcing him to use the elevator. Hal Sparks comes in to clarify this was definitely an early 2000s movie. Cool spidey outfit. 
Thanks. I actually never thought this scene was written that funny, but let's be honest, this image alone is all you need. They can say anything and you're guaranteed to laugh. The only thing that makes this image funnier is if you switched them out with You already have them in dual roles, I promise nobody would question this! The next day, Peter tries calling Mary Jane to explain why he wasn't at the play, but he runs out of money to put in the phone. I wanna tell you the truth. Here it is. I'm Player X. I'm Spider-Man. That too. Though I actually get less hate for that. I think. The next day, Peter attends Dr. Evil's experiment, as well as apparently open mic night. Has anybody lost a large roll of $20 bills in a rubber band? Because we found the rubber band. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. Am I giving it to the Stockholm, or is this awkward first date writing actually starting to grow on me? Octavius gets on to his groundbreaking experiment, just using these everyday mechanical arms that hook into a cerebellum using artificial intelligence to control their movements. Fuck the sun thing! There's like a million gold mines in those alone! If the artificial intelligence in the arms is as advanced as you suggest, uh, couldn't that make you vulnerable to them? One may ask, why even put artificial intelligence in a tool like that? It's like giving construction equipment a soul, as we saw in Supergirl, that is so dangerous! Fasten your seatbelts. He gives the order to Jin to start the experiment, but it wouldn't be a Spider-Man movie without science going wrong. Or an extra giving a weird line read. This is a breakthrough beyond your father's dreams. I just learned that line two seconds ago. I'm proud of however I said it. The energy starts sucking all the metal into it though, causing it to go awry. Shut it off! I'm in This doesn't change anything. Okay, into the sun you go. We get one of those wonderful gruesome without really being gruesome deaths as his wife is stabbed in the eye with a piece of glass killing her. How about that? A Spider-Man movie that actually earns its PG-13 rating. But Critic, what about Mary Jane's wet shirt, the disintegrating skeletons, and the goblin killing people? Which were shown in the trailer approved for all audiences. Well, clearly you had to be over 13 in order to accept the disturbing nature of all of those. But what about- This was PG! Cut the umbilical cord! It's continued with a great scene when Octavius is knocked out, but his arms are still awake, killing all the doctors trying to remove them. <laughs> Sorry, that was from the Evil Dead movies, but it's wonderfully hard to tell, isn't it? Apparently Octavius was not that well sedated as he wakes up seconds after his arms killed everybody. Oh, is that operation gonna take two minutes? No! Oh, that's how I was supposed to do it. The Daily Bugle tries to think up what to name their latest scientist gone wrong. Uh, science squid? Crap. Doctor Strange. That's pretty good. Wow, that shout out worked. Mad scientist goes berserk and we don't have pictures. I heard Spider-Man was there. I look forward to where that doesn't go. As much as I bash the lame exposition in the first film, this might have the most poorly written introduction to an absolutely pointless character in any of these movies. And I need you, come here. You're all I got. Big party for an American hero. My son, the astronaut. Oh, that line's so bad, even Simmons couldn't save it. Maybe if it was, they're celebrating my son. Oh, you have a son? Yes, he's in the space program. He's an astronaut. Or it's for my son, John. He just returned from space. Really? From space? Yes, he's an astronaut. But no, we get the most forced, unnatural introductory line of... My son, the astronaut. Have you met my coworker, the editor? He's right next to my acquaintance, the secretary. Say hello to my black guy, the black guy. Oh, what do you care you'll forget about when you see us followed by this meme? Could you pay me in advance? <laughs> Meanwhile, Octavius hides out near the water as the AI and his arms seem to be controlling him. And at first the thought of the AI arms going evil seemed a little dumb, but it does kind of make sense. They're programmed to finish the experiment, and that's exactly what they'll do, by any means necessary. 
So whether it's getting equipment to keep it going, robbing a bank to buy that equipment, or gloating about killing innocent people, wait, what? Now you'll have this woman's death on your conscience! Or I'll peel the flesh off her bones. Okay, somewhere a few extra steps were taken, but Christ, those arms look cool! <laughs> and this pretty awesome fight scene, Spider-Man tries to stop Doc Ock from Scrooge McDucking people to death as he takes Aunt May hostage. Take it away, awkward extras! <laughs> Sometimes I have no idea what this movie is doing, I just know I have no choice but to love it. Spider-Man defeats Doc Ock, though, saving Aunt May. There you go. <gasps> Don't I get to kiss upside down? Jesus, Aunt May. Wait, Peter? I mean... Fuck. Later that night, Peter covers Jameson's big event. There's out of my wife with the minister here. Oh, have you met my son, the astronaut? This is all for my son, the astronaut. Keep an eye out for the astronaut, my son. The committee is pleased to present the handsome, the heroic, the delicious. The hell? The delicious Captain John James. That was so uncomfortable, I feel like John Travolta was holding that moment by its chin. It's revealed that he's going out with Mary Jane, which I guess makes Peter think this is the perfect time to make his move. Day by day, he gazed upon her. Day by day, he sighed with passion. Don't by day. start. Oh, golly gee, Beef, reading poetry to her didn't work. I guess I better move on to serenading her upon moonlight. John has seen my show five times. Even my father, he came backstage to borrow cash. I am more than happy to ask you for cash. My rent is years due. After Harry slaps Peter for not turning Spider-Man into You're him. You're tearing me apart, Peter! Son, the astronaut, says Mary Jane, just agreed to marry him. And yes, I know he has a name, but honestly, that is all he is in this film. Son, the astronaut. He's the only plot device I think is legit bad in this movie, because you could cut him out and you wouldn't miss a thing. He's barely in the film, there's no reason to make him Jameson's son, he has no personality as there's no time to give him one. And there's no reason to have him marry MJ except that's what every 90s rom-com was doing. So it's perfect for this 2004 flick. I guess the idea is to build up all the bad stuff happening to Peter, but there's already enough. You can cut him out and still get the same amount of pressure and guilt. If anything, it makes Mary Jane look douchey. She's apparently at a point where she's ready to marry this guy, yet she's still putting the moves on Peter. I mean, what was this, a month ago? I miss your Uncle Ben. Can you believe that it's two years next month since he was taken? Yeah, and that scene hasn't happened yet. So it's safe to say she's ready to marry this guy, and yet she's still hitting on her ex-boyfriend! Not even ex-boyfriend, just ex-friend-friend! In the deleted scenes, they explain this a bit more, at least adding to her character a bit, but in the theatrical cut, this is entirely pointless. You're such a mystery. The only bigger mystery is, WHY WAS THIS GUY IN THIS MOVIE?! Peter's powers continue to fail him, so he goes to see a cool doctor. You know, he has a tie-dye shirt, so he's cool. And he talks about a dream where he's Spider-Man and his powers don't work. I'm Spider-Man, but I'm losing my powers. I'm climbing a wall, but I keep falling. Oh my god, you're Wonder Woman. My diagnosis? It's up here. He starts to put together he may not want to be Spider-Man anymore as a dream vision zombie visit from Uncle Ben has him calling it quits. I can't live your dreams anymore. Take my hand, son. I'm gonna take you to Christmas past. Yeah, what was that supposed to do? I'm Spider-Man. No more. Please. You have one more movie until that. He tosses out the suit and leaves Spider-Man behind, proving with no power comes not giving a shit. Eh, I hope they die. So now that you're engaged, I turned down your advances and I treated you like shit. Wanna go out? Will you think about it? Think about what? Picking up where we left off. Punch me, I bleed. He's giving you an open invitation to punch him. Don't miss this opportunity. Meanwhile, at the Daily Bugle, somebody has something interesting to drop off. It's a pineapple. <laughs> I finally got to him. Jameson is of course thrilled that Spider-Man threw in the towel, but the guilt finally gets to Peter, who confesses to Aunt May he's the reason Uncle Ben is dead. What do you mean? I went someplace else. I really like this scene because unlike the other times Peter cries where it looks like they just put drops in his eyes before shouting action here, he really works up to it. It feels real. I also like that for such a friendly, go-lucky world, the friendliest character in the movies doesn't let him off so easily. 
In fact, here's a recreation of every movie theater in the world when this scene played. I've tried to tell you so many times. Oh my god! But you know I'm also Spider-Man! So there's a happy ending! For me. Octavius finishes his machine and visits Harry to get the missing tritium he needs to make it work. Harry tells him if he gets Spider-Man, he'll give him all the tritium he wants. How do I find him? Peter Parker. Parker? He takes pictures of Spider-Man for the bugle. A couple for Vanity Fair. Bottom line, they're close. Meanwhile, crime is up 75%. Okay, even everyone from the Spider-Verse couldn't make that big a difference. As yet another kid is trapped in a fire. Does nobody listen to Bugs Bunny fire safety? You know, kids, the kitchen ain't a playground. Peter saves her, but finds out some more bad news. Some poor soul got trapped on the fourth floor. Do we have time to do another? No. You're fantastic! Now it's time for cake! You got a message. It's your aunt. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This scene honestly doesn't add a ton and can probably be cut out, but it goes against the Twelfth Commandment. Thou shalt not cut out any scene that has these two in them. Which honestly made more sense than the Eleventh Commandment. Peter visits Aunt May again in the hopes that maybe she's forgiven him. Oh hey, husband killer! What's up? Pish posh, we needn't talk about it. She of course forgives him, spewing a super long-winded speech about what it means to be a hero. That keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. Originally, I thought this deserved a little leeway because I thought this was her way of saying that she knows that he's Spider-Man. But in the next film, she still seems to be in the dark. So what should take a few lines to hit the mark goes on for what feels like an eternity, even with an actress this good saying it. Kids like Henry need a hero. Courageous, self-sacrificing people. People line up people. for them, cheer them, scream their names, and years Everybody later they'll tell... Everybody loves a hero. Just to get a glimpse of the one who taught him I the whole... I believe there's a hero in all of us. Honestly, this whole part of the movie starts to drag a bit. Maybe it's because we know what the characters are gonna do. He's gonna go back to being Spider-Man. She's not gonna marry my son, the astronaut. Spider-Man's gonna fight Octavius. The pieces are set. The emotions are actually very well established. Yet this drags on for 30 minutes. You don't need the long speeches. You don't need him practicing again. You don't need this incredibly disturbing O face. You hit the mark fine. Now you're kind of overstaying your welcome. Next, you'll say there's another Peter dumping MJ scene. I thought I could be there for you, but I can't. The scene is at least short, as it's interrupted by Octavius finally getting the ball rolling again. Or, the car, I should say. <laughs> yeah, as when Harry told you to convince Peter to tell you where Spider-Man is, he meant to throw a car at him and hope he has superhuman abilities to sense it and not be killed. What the hell would he have done if he didn't have those powers and didn't move out of the way? Peter, tell me where Spider-Man is! Or blink! Or stop bleeding! This was a bad idea. He kidnaps Mary Jane because, you know, they wanted to mix things up. But Peter gets his powers back, makes an Arthur fist, and gives the coolest shot in the movie. Wow, my sunglasses has some 4K quality shit going on there. Oh, where's the incredible one-liners from the first film when you need them? Your time is up, Spider-Man! It's you whose time is up, Doc Ock! Up of your mind! <laughs> the action takes them to easily the best scene in the movie as they fight on a train that's out of control and Spider-Man has to save everybody. Even if a few of these effects are a hint dated, and I do mean only a few, it's just a cool idea that they take every advantage of. I feel like everything you could do with this action sequence, they accomplish. Even if it does lead to some pretty hilarious faces. <laughs> it's great when your hero's action face constantly looks like he's trying to hold in a fart. In a truly touching moment, all the people on the train agree they won't reveal his secret identity. Even Big Pussy and Dan Castellaneta. It's alright. We won't tell nobody. Well, great. Doesn't mean all the people who took pictures on their phones are gonna be that quiet. <laughs> Doc Ock knocks out Spider-Man, though, and exchanges him for the Tritium. 
allowing Harry to discover the truth. Actually, no, I wouldn't tell Doc Ock who Spider-Man was, so he threw me in the spider suit. There, I saved two subplots for movie three, and yet somehow there's still 19 left! Peter tells Harry MJ is in danger, and he needs to tell him where they are. Surprise. Thank God you're under this leaky pipe. For a second, I thought we weren't gonna have you drenched in a Spider-Man movie. <laughs> Quick, Peter, try poetry on him! <laughs> Peter literally knocks some sense into Doc Ock, and he realizes the error of his ways and tries to stop the machine from destroying the city. He sacrifices himself while Peter accidentally reveals who he is to MJ. Spider-Man will always have enemies. I can't let you take that risk. Well, it's good to know I'm only cheating on one person now. He drops her off as the movie shows that Harry will still have a place for Peter, though. Son. I'm here. He hallucinates his father's ghost, leading him to the only thing that could possibly destroy Spider-Man. Sony's ideas for the sequel. It looks like at MJ's wedding, though, she leaves her kind fiancé. Again, little screen time, but he seemed nice enough. Humiliated at the altar to be in a relationship based entirely on lies. Call Deborah. Tell her not to open the caviar. My son, the astronaut, was left by my ex-daughter-in-law, the bitch. After running by a very bizarre Punisher cameo. Original MCU? Mary Jane confesses her love to Peter. I know there will be risks, but I want to face them with you. I mean, people kidnap me over and over even when I wasn't with you, so might as well have the sex. Peter is finally given a happy ending as he swings by copters from I think the Playmobil movie and a look of dread looms over Mary Jane's face. Don't worry, great things are on the horizon for you. It's an appropriate look. So that was Spider-Man 2. Is it corny and hokey like the first one? Sure, but I feel like people expect, even prefer that by this point. On top of that, even if the style isn't your thing, there's still a lot of amazing elements in it. The effects surprisingly hold up pretty well, and even when they don't, they're super energized. It really takes time to show the little things that might impact a superhero's life that superhero movies really didn't do back then. And despite a few hiccups, it really feels like it has a unique voice, both comedically and dramatically. I like that it can balance quiet, heartfelt moments with really zany, over-the-top antics in a way that's odd, but also engaging. The world and characters feel more fleshed out, but in a way that advances the style rather than takes away from it. Sure, a few things don't hold up, but I find more elements that get better with time than I do elements that date it. So swing on in and take a look at the best of Raimi's Spider-Man films. Right before we swing in and look at his... not those things I just said. I'm a nostalgia critic, and get your dancing shoes ready. Spider moss, spider moss, still from nothing that rhymes with moss. Maybe we should change the name. Quip sound good? Yeah, let's go with quip. Look out! Here comes Hooray! Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. The internet has come a long way, hasn't it? The sharing of information, entertainment, and opinions has connected the world unlike anything else in history. True, early on people were divisive, angry, and unsure how to accept something they weren't familiar with. But as time went on, that changed. The internet is now more open more understanding, and will share their point of view instead of shoving it down people's throat. Nah, just kidding, we're more divisive than ever. As the human representation of the internet, it's my job to say you're wrong, you're all wrong! I just thought, is it my thought? I don't know. You should know my thoughts and agree with them. Get out of here! Sir, someone said something. Give an extreme reaction to it. But you don't know what it is yet. Do I? Do you? Wow, that's deep. Bob! Right here? Oh, right. My next blog post. I said something deep. Let it change your life. What did you say? Doesn't matter. Guess not. Get out of here! Ah, critic, sit down! There's no place to- Liz, sit down for the critic! Yes, sir. I understand you're going to review Spider-Man 3. Oh, yes, that's right, Mr. Internet. It's a menace. Well, it's definitely a mess, but- It's the worst thing ever made! I robbed a bank, kicked a puppy, and pissed on my leg! A movie can do all that? If I said it, it must be true. I mean, there's some good things in it. I don't want to lie about my opinion. What are you? One of them? Who? I don't know. Your silence only makes you look more guilty. Get out of here! I can handle this! Your silence only makes you look more guilty. But you can fix that. Give me reviews of Spider-Man 3 terrorizing the city! That doesn't make any sense. Troll! What? Your desk is uneven. Liz, get him a coffee while you're down there! How? Don't make this political. How is that? Go! 
Look, I have to tell people what I really think. I'm sorry I didn't get your written script about what my opinion is. I know, that's why I brought you an extra copy. Make sure Spider-Man 3 looks like the worst thing ever created by human beings or you're fired. I'm fired? That wasn't the intent, but sure. Look, in such a vibrant, colorful field, do you think it's right to be so black and white? The internet is colorblind. Now you hate Spider-Man 3 like everyone else. Now take your coffee and get out. How did get out of here! Liz, clean that up. Okay, here's my opinion. It may not be popular, but it's honest. I think there's something of value in every Spider-Man movie. Burn him! <laughs> no matter how good or how bad, every Spider-Man movie gave me something that made me glad I watched it. I know that doesn't match the internet's all-in mentality of you either have to 100% hate something or love something. But maybe the idea of Spider-Man is so good that it always has something strong sewn into it. <sighs> And even though the internet says I'm supposed to hate everything about it, I do find some value in Spider-Man 3. Ah! A Spider-Man movie so despised, even its director has called it awful. Spider-Man 3 made a bundle at the box office, but didn't win over as many fans and audiences as it would have liked. Though Rotten Tomatoes technically has a positive critical rating, and even audience reaction is half and half, the people that hated Spider-Man 3 loathed it as one of the worst comic book movies ever made. When compared to its predecessors, which pushed comic book movies forward in a unique way and took its time evolving the characters, for the most part, 3 did seem like a step backwards. It crammed in too much story, too many characters, and you thought the other movies were zany? This has a musical number, baby! Objectifiably. I think you mean objectively. No, I think you're wrong, Jay Jonas. <sighs> it is one of the worst sequels by comparison. But, like the rest of the films, it went all out. Honestly, too all out. Creating something that, in my opinion, was still unique and entertaining. Like the other films, I do still have a soft spot for it and think the good moments aren't represented enough. So we're gonna take a look at what worked, what didn't work, and what really didn't work. But also what worked. So long as the internet's okay with me having an opinion that's different from the rest, I better lock the door. <laughs> Let's take a look at Spider-Man 3. The film opens, ironically, with everybody loving Spider-Man. He's seen as a hero, Peter's praised in his class, except with people over 40, and his girlfriend Mary Jane even got a starring role in a Broadway play. So they say... It's my girlfriend. Mine too. Wait, what? Huh. The only hiccup is Harry might become a vengeful, insane maniac, but aside from that, things are good. I need to talk to you, explain things. Tell it to my father. Raise him from the dead. Hey, I know the devil. I can make that happen. Was I good? Good. You were great. And those are from Harry. What's with you guys, anyway? It's complicated. Tell me again. Was I really good? I mean, I know my husband's connection to the son of the Green Goblin should probably be in focus, but tell me, was I good? While hanging out on the web, a meteor with a mysterious black goo on it lands next to them. That shouldn't really be explained in a passing tone, but that's what the movie does, so I'm just gonna give it the possessed hand sound effect from Evil Dead 2 and move on. <laughs> Meanwhile, police are in very slow pursuit of escaped convict Flint Marco, perfectly cast with Thomas Hayden Church. The crime he committed was apparently out of love for his daughter, who is very ill and needs money for surgery. Honestly, this is one of the more adult scenes in any of the Raimi films. I'm just here to see my daughter. You're not getting near her. Good reason for what it was doing, and that's the truth. That is the truth that you left behind. Ah! It's so terrible! You know not literally every second of this film is bad. Wrong! Peter confesses to Aunt May that he's gonna ask MJ to marry him. In the time scale of things, this does seem a bit fast, as it doesn't look like they've been going out for very long. I mean, him and Harry haven't talked yet, so not that much time must have passed. But hey, if she said yes to a guy who got two minutes of screen time, surely she'll say yes here. The day your Uncle Ben asked me to marry him, he was so scared and excited and very young. Why do I feel like every scene of her should start with Titanic was called the Ship of Dreams? Your uncle had it all planned. He took me to the beach one Sunday. And then he said, close your eyes, May. And I did. And then he whipped it out. Aunt May! They didn't call him Ben 10 inches for nothing. Oh, hi, Harry. Whoa! 
Harry reveals himself as new Goblin. Oh really, that's what he's credited as. And ironically, where the original Goblin costume looked too silly, this one looks too boring. He looks like a snowboarding St. Patrick's Day shredder. I feel like you could have done more with this. You knew this was coming, Pete. Now the effects in this film have gotten a lot of flack over the years, but do you even first movie, bro? There are occasional shots here and there where the camera tracking does make them look especially cartoony, but the majority of them, for the time especially, I think are ambitious and creatively thought out. Like in 2, they don't always look real, but they look cool. Even if some of them, I swear, must have been going for a laugh. Harry? And Peter never saw Harry's corpse again. Off you go, Peter. No, he takes Harry to the hospital, which must have been fun to explain. <laughs> yeah, he was rocket surfing down an alleyway in his weaponized armor and then Deadpool hit him. But not far away, Flint runs away from the police into, you guessed it, another science experiment. <laughs> I do love how these films get more and more lazy with how their villains transform. There's a change in the silicon mass. Yeah, it's probably a bird. It'll fly away when we fire it up. Pretty big bird. Yeah, it's probably 20 birds stacked on top of each other to form human shape. Yeah, you're right. We're scientists. Variables don't matter to us. As always, we're shown on a molecular level the changes that take place, as like sands in the hourglass, and eh, you know. No! No! I'm gonna be coarse, rough, and get everywhere! So, wouldn't you know it, Harry happens to get amnesia and doesn't remember a thing. And I'm not gonna lie, his dopey, happy-go-lucky performance is one of my favorite things in the movie. Hit my head. I got here as fast as I could. I know that face. Great. Oh, 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 oh. You have lovely friends. My best friends. I don't have a care in the world. It's like I'm hosting the Oscars again. This brings us to yet another scene that is one of the best in any of the Spider-Mans. The Sandman coming to life is right out of a poetic monster movie. So many of the emotional scenes in these films rely on speeches that usually go on too long, but here, no dialogue, no over-explaining, just a person trying to emotionally and physically pull himself back together. The effects are beautiful, the music touching, the imagery almost haunting in how simple yet imaginative it is. It's like an artistically fascinating short film snuck its way into this superhero movie. It's one of my favorite, if not my absolute favorite moment as there's no other scenes like this in any of the previous films. Wow, I never thought about it that way. Just say I'm wrong. No, really, you're making me look at things from a different point of view. Just say I'm wrong. No, honestly, I'm going deep Just inside say I'm wrong. my soul Just say I'm wrong. Say, you know what, maybe I'm wrong. jumping to conclusions Just say I'm wrong. too much. Maybe Just I'm too wrong. wrong. Maybe I'm too Just say I'm wrong. wrong. Mary Jane returns with negative reviews of the film, I mean of her performance, as she's looking for emotional support from Peter, but another crime for Spider-Man interrupts. Go get him, Tiger. Sorry. I have to also give credit, this is the first time I actually find Peter and Mary Jane's relationship interesting as... They finally acknowledge it's not a healthy relationship. Yeah, you know all those jokes I made before about how it's all based on lies and secrets and being emotionally immature? Well here, it catches up with them. And I don't think that's something they just made up on the spot. I think they were kind of planning that from the beginning, as look at Mary Jane's face at the end of 2. They must have known at some point they were going to have to address relationship issues. And here, that's finally what they're doing. As things are finally going Peter's way, Mary Jane becomes the film's new punching bag. And he's not there to help her because he's too busy with Spider-Man stuff. Spider-Man gets attacked all the time. This isn't about you. I look at these words, and it's like my father wrote them. All cars. All cars in the vicinity of- She tries to understand, but the same way romantic angst was building with Peter, now it's building with her. I know that you made a mistake and that you feel guilty, but I want to be here for you. Okay. I get it. Thank you. It might be the only time in these movies they talk about a relationship like an actual relationship. But you know, that dance! So you can't be affected by any of this. Okay, to the credit of this film's criticism, all of this would be fine and elevate the series to a new level if that's all they focused on. And it's not. There's another girl entering the picture named Gwen Stacy, played by Bryce Dallas Howard. She's the daughter of the police captain, played by James Cromwell, going out with Topher Grace, played by Topher Grace, who's a photographer trying to take over Parker's job. She's also a model who doesn't know when to move out of the way of a crane. 
Spider-Woman in another universe, everybody. And all of this is revealed in literally one minute. It's Gwen. Who are you? It's Brock, sir. I work at the Daily Bugle. And I'm dating your daughter. That's a mighty fine exposition there. And I'm dating your daughter. Have I also told you about my son, the astronaut? Spider-Man saves her and becomes such a big hero that Gwen puts together an event to offer him the key to the city. I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. May sound corny now, but when I'm dead, you're gonna cry. Meanwhile, Harry is still, gosh darn, in the greatest of moods. Hey, do I have any girlfriends? I don't know. Where do babies come from? God, I'm high. He always appreciated how you helped me through high school. Just wish I could remember more about him. This picture makes him seem like a nice guy, who's secretly a blacklight image from the Haunted Mansion. The next day, cops spot Flint and track him down to a sand truck. I hope you have superpowers or else I'm about to murder you. Oh, that's lucky. Yeah, I'm not sure why when he's bigger, his vocabulary switches to Maybe he saw a hot woman and had to try his flirting cat sounds. <laughs> Waiter. Oh, great. Now I have sand in my shoe. My cotton candy tastes like pink. Hey, MJ. Hey, Pete said you're in a play. I, I was like, um... You know, this is embarrassing, but I once wrote you a play in high school. <laughs> you wrote me a play? Yeah. It was called Princess Pretty Pretty and the Pretty 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 by Harry Me. Gwen somehow knows exactly where to point to introduce the web slinger as the crowd encourages him to kiss her. Go ahead, lay one on me. They'll love it. This gets tricky as Peter knows MJ is in the crowd, so this just kind of comes across as douchey. I think what they're hinting at is Peter is so confident and knows so little about relationships. Day by day, he gazed upon her. Day by day, he <laughs> clearly that he didn't put together this would hurt her, especially seeing their love is so strong that he's about to propose to her. I guess that's possible, but Christ, does that seem douchey? Like, can even he be that dumb? I mean, Mary Jane was only with two other men when she gave that kiss, and one of them was you. Yeah, like I said, I'm glad they're showing this is not the best couple. Same man tries robbing a bank, and in yet another pretty cool fight scene, Spider-Man stops him, but he gets away. Where do all these guys come from? And more importantly, can they be memed more than me on the internet? gets ready to propose at a fancy restaurant where Bruce Campbell plays the maitre d'. Becker. Parker. That is what I said, Becker. I always imagined this was the same guy from every film. He just keeps losing jobs and put on an incredibly fake French accent to get this one. He even at one point just randomly says, I am French. Romance. I am French. Unless you see IRS, in which case I am Russian from Moscow. Mary Jane arrives, but so does Gwen, who also happens to be in Peter's class. Now how could this go wrong? Pete, if you've got a picture of my kiss with Spider-Man, after all, who gets kissed by Spider-Man, right? I can't imagine. I don't feel very well, I'm sorry, I have to go. MJ walks out saying Peter just doesn't understand her, which I think is fair. As subplot 122 is introduced, the police say Flint Marco is the real killer of Uncle Ben. What are you doing? You ever saunter with the spiders in the sandbox of life? You might be wondering, why weren't they told about this? Why weren't we told about this? Settle down, son. No, I have no intention of settling- Hey, he said settle down! I think that explains everything. Yeah, this is when the movie starts to spiral out of control. Not only is there now another killer of Uncle Ben, great, we get to go back to that, but the black goo from the meteor clings onto Peter, thus starting one of my favorite storylines from the comic, The Alien Costume Saga. Now there, it's a long process of the suit slowly corrupting him, balancing difficult choices with dark imagery. Something you would think the director of Evil Dead and a simple plan could do in his sleep. But weirdly, it's done like... Well, we've compared these to the Superman movies before, so let's do it again. It's done like Superman 3. He acts mean, but it's almost played more for laughs. 
You see, at first, it looks like it might work with Peter killing Flint with water in a fight that hasn't aged that great. But at least has the heightened vengeance down from the suit. Good riddance. After that, though, it's the start of... Emo Peter. Emo Peter is awful. You're right! Of course I am! Don't get me wrong, Emo Peter is hilarious. Covering his hair over his eye, wearing all black, trying to act cool when a teen who sees himself as Rick when really he's a Morty acts cool. It's funny, but when you think of the movie we could be getting, the one the posters were promising, it is a letdown. Give me rent. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! And you, your cake suck! Peter tells Aunt May Spider-Man killed Flint. I guess clarifying she didn't figure out he was Spider-Man from the last film. Though honestly, I'd like to think she did, and this is just her secret backhanded way of teaching him a lesson. Spider-Man killed him. Spider-Man? Spider-Man doesn't kill people. I think if Spider-Man were here, I'd call him a psychopath. No. If Spider-Man were here, he'd probably call you too soft. I think Spider-Man needs Jesus. I think Spider-Man's telling you to shut the hell up! I think Spider-Man's very rude. Yeah, Spider-Man's a dick. Meanwhile, Mary Jane is still feeling isolated, so she reaches out to someone who will understand. This is even better than quilt sewing. Oh boy, the phone! I hope it's cotton candy delivery! Hello? MJ comes over to Harry's to do some swing omelet cooking. My god, even Mickey Mouse would look at you saying, Damn, you all need to get laid. As MJ puts the moves on him, instantly regretting it. I didn't mean to do that. No, it's, it's okay. Mary Jane, please. I'm sorry. Would it help if we kissed upside down in the shower? My butler can help. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, Harry gets his memory back and remembers he wants revenge. And thus begins the part of the movie I easily hate the most. And yes, I am aware that's saying quite a bit. Harry forcing MJ to break up with Peter. It's over. No. Please. Please don't say that. Couple things. One, there's a million ways out of this. Just go up to Peter and tell him, Harry's over there. He wants me to break up with you. What a statue, Adam. <laughs> Second, it just made me realize why do they have Harry have amnesia at all? Wouldn't it make more sense if it was written he acted like everything was good and slowly worked his way into breaking Peter and MJ up? It'd make him a more diabolical villain and it wouldn't waste any time. Third, this is the first time I've actually given a shit about Peter and MJ's relationship because they actually gave them relatable problems. It was more than just romantic one-liners and will-they-won't-they they cliches. Now it's just a third party forcing them to hate each other. It's not relatable and it's unbelievably forced. Even when Harry meets up with Peter, he doesn't seem that bummed. Who would be after this romance takes such a stupid turn? Harry, I was gonna propose to her. <sighs> anyway, how is your sex life? <laughs> how does that always keep happening? I'm the other guy. How's the pie? So good. That look you give when you got away with giving a troll performance for half the movie. <laughs> That dude has a look like. Did that weirdo just get up and run behind the wall when that truck passed? I gotta stop going to coffee shops with needles on the floor. So Peter pulls out his secret weapon. He goes to Harry's home where he confronts him. And when she kissed me, that taste. Strawberries. Mm. Peter starts fighting him as Harry reveals he found Dad's secret stash. <laughs> Good news, I have amnesia again. You gonna kill me like you killed my father? You were an embarrassment to him. <laughs> gonna cry? Hypocrite. <laughs> Parker blows Harry's face up and discovers the next day Eddie Brock has sent fake pictures to the Daily Bugle. My son thought the world of this guy. I have a nine-year-old daughter who loves Spider-Man. Who's she supposed to look up to now? I mean, the first couple of times we hated him and wanted him arrested, but the 27th time, that's too many. Peter goes to the Beagle to confront Brock, who I have to admit is kind of growing on me. Not as an authentic Eddie Brock, but more as a bizarro Peter. He's like if Peter was wormy and had no ethics. So, Spider-Man 3 Peter, the more I think about it. Tell him to check his source next time. It's a fake. Photographic department confirms it. Yeah, you really needed to circle those to prove it's a fake. Gee, why don't you show me how this wasn't the largest inauguration either? 
Peter does his infamous strut, which again, might be funny in the same way a dork tries to act cool, but do people like him or not? In one scene, they're repulsed by him, but in another, they're all over him. It just keeps going back and forth, so even the movie doesn't have an idea of what we're supposed to think of him. That wasn't cool. I have some nuts I could make some. Go make me some. Peter even starts dating Gwen and takes her to the jazz club where MJ works. Find us some shade. Mr. Washington says there's a table ready. Well, Mr. Washington better know cloning because he needs 49 more Washingtons for me to do shit. Isn't that your old girlfriend? Mary Jane, show us what you got. MJ gets up to sing and... All right, here we go, here we go. Now the real show's about to start here, Mary. You want some, man? Want some, man? That's good, man. That's really good. Oh, man. What are you doing? You know what we're doing. You're trying to be nice to this movie? Well, let's see you be nice to this. Let's see you dance your way out of this one. Oh, I see what you did there. That was good. That was good. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. All right. Let's talk about the dance number. Double tap! It's every bit as insane as you remember it. I guess to the trilogy's credit, this does almost seem like the next logical step. I mean, we went from wrestling to poetry reading to talking arms. Why wouldn't there be a dance number by this point? And let's also be honest, the scene is meant to be funny? And it's fucking hilarious! Now dig on this. It's like Arnold from Batman and Robin. I don't know what way it was supposed to make me laugh, but it is definitely making me laugh. Let's also give credit to hands down the best performances in the movie. Not Kirsten Dunst, not Thomas Hayne Church, but the black people who have to act like they're digging this. Oh yeah, Tobey Maguire and Bryce Dallas Howard dancing to jazz? There has never been a whiter thing said in the history of mankind, and we love it. Give every black person in this scene an Oscar, cause they fucking deserve it. But honestly, the goofiness of this scene I could handle as I've kinda gotten used to it in these movies. It's just that we could be spending this time really diving into the duality of Peter and the alien suit. In the comic, there's a dream sequence. It's one of the most iconic in all of Spider-Man history. With Sam Raimi's dark visual style, this could be absolutely amazing. But instead, it's replaced with Peter's nipples blowing air on his date. It's hard to believe what's happening. Oh, that was satisfying. Was it good for you, Internet? Nothing's ever good for me. <sighs> there have been better scenes. Sure, after you saw the worst. That was all for her? I thought you took me to your ex-girlfriend's job so we could get coupons. You know, for a science major, I'm pretty dumb! Peter gets in a fight with Mary Jane, even ending up hitting her, which finally makes him realize the suit has pushed him too far. Did you really think when you saw this scene on the poster, this would be the scene that leads up to it? This guy knows how Christianity works. I come before you today to ask you for one thing. I want you to kill Peter Parker. Yes, as Jesus said in the Bible, do one to others. You want me to kill a guy? I'll fucking kill a guy. Peter uses the bell to get the suit off of him, causing it to fall onto Brock, transforming him into Venom. He so happens to bump into the Sandman. Yeah, New York is a pretty small city. And they both vow revenge on Spider-Man. I want to kill the spider. You want to kill the spider. Interested? While the recent Venom movie certainly looks more like the comic, this one actually does look pretty good. Incorporating the spider suit texture into the skin and coming across is genuinely intimidating. Honestly, given a lot of other things we've seen in this movie, I kinda thought this would be a lot worse. Hey, I forget, how do all these movies end again? A young woman held hostage in a taxi. The hostage has been identified as Mary Jane Watson. Shouldn't the news caption read, Yep, this bitch again. We're now going to take you live to the scene with Jennifer Dugan. We were going to let April O'Neil and Lois Lane report on this story, but they're kidnapped with her in the car, too. Harry discovers from his butler what really should have been told to save tons of lives when you add everything up. The night your father died, there's no question that he died by his own hand. Why do old people keep really important shit from young people in these movies? I loved your father as I have loved you, Harry. Enough to allow you to ruin your life on several occasions. You're like a weekend father who doesn't show up on weekends. As your friends love you. Anyway, I'll go fire myself. No unemployment checks. I figured. 
I have to admit, the film really does get back to its cornball sappiness these movies are best known for, as Spider-Man comes to save the day, first posing by an American flag, and giving these extras more cheese to chew on than a Velveeta factory. He seems to have come out of nowhere to answer the prayers of the city, just when all hope seemed to be lost. I'm Mary Benign, and I'm ending this report on a slow, inspiring head shake. He finds he can't fight off evil Pac-Man and Sand Shrek alone, so Harry finally arrives to help. Harry sacrifices himself to save Peter as Peter finally figures out how to blow up the alien suit and Topher Grace's career. I'll be back when Spike Lee wants to cast a douche as a Klansman! It's okay though, the Sandman is really sorry. I told your uncle all I wanted was the car. What is it? I need your car. Peter finds out the killing of Uncle Ben was at least done in the nicest way possible and finds it in his heart to forgive him. The only thing left to me now is my daughter. I forgive you. I'm not asking for forgiveness, I'm asking for money. My daughter still needs an operation. Well, I'm off to rob another bank. Hopefully my kid lives. This was an odd way to wrap things up for me. Remember to watch Wings. Harry dies as they go to, what, their fifth visit to the graveyard? You know, you do six funerals and the seventh is free. And Peter visits Mary Jane once more at her job. Sorry, but I'm getting married. Seriously? Yeah, another astronaut too. And that was Spider-Man 3. Yeah, uh -huh. tell us, tell us that was actually a good movie. <sighs> It was way too much and totally insane, even as these movies go, but I can't act like I wasn't entertained. Oh! Maybe because I already didn't take these films that seriously, I just didn't feel as betrayed as everyone else did. I like the majority of the action, it always kept my attention, and the stuff that works I think is some of the best in three movies. But when it doesn't work, it's some of the worst. And weirdly, sometimes the best moments and worst moments are one and the same. Sandman is a great character, except when he eventually isn't. The main relationship is well handled, except when it eventually isn't. The effects are really good, except when they eventually aren't. I feel like all they needed to focus on were two of these storylines, like maybe the black suit and the romance, similar to what they did in two, focusing on Peter's personal life and Doc Ock. But they tried too many things, leaving too many missed opportunities, because they couldn't squeeze it all in. But when I saw this movie, audiences gasped three times. And no, it wasn't at that moment. Once when the ring was almost lost, another when Harry and MJ kissed, and the final when Peter hit her. Any film that got a crowd invested enough to gasp three times is doing something right. But yeah, I can't ignore the bad stuff. It is way too much being juggled, causing motivations to not always make sense, and sometimes even the characters coming across as unlikable. So I guess it depends. If you're looking for some of the best scenes in the Spider-Man movies, there's certainly some here. But if you're looking for the best Spider-Man movie, you are definitely far from home. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, and next week we'll move on to less divisive Spider-Man movies, the Mark Webb films. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Why is that funny? Oh, oh no. Oh, shit. Spider days, spider days. Sorry, there's more things that rhyme with days. Let's start rhyming them right now. Wait, I think we messed it up. Goddamn. We really hate this song. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. So you think the Raimi films got backlash? Wait until I reveal the tangled Mark web that we weave. With Spider-Man 3 disappointing many fans and even the filmmakers themselves becoming frustrated, Sony decided no more films were gonna come out of this universe. But there was a problem. Sony's rights to the Spider-Man character required a movie to be made every five years if they wanted to keep them. Which meant the long time span usually provided between rebooted franchises like Batman and Superman was cut pretty damn tight from 2007 to 2012. Let's be honest, not giving enough time for people to put the old Spider-Man franchise behind them and crave a new one. Which is why I have the controversial thought. Okay, not hugely controversial. Okay, honestly not controversial. Pretty much, yeah. I think that- Hello, Mr. Internet. You're gonna regret it. I told you before, I'm not gonna lie. You're gonna regret it. Look, I'm hired to give my honest thoughts and a unique point of view, and that's what I'm gonna do. 
Your funeral. I think Amazing Spider-Man is a fascinating movie. <gasps> you can't say that! <laughs> With that said, I don't think it's the best Spider-Man movie. Into the Spider-Verse has blown them all out of the water, the MCU films might be slow burning to the big stuff, which I'm down to wait for. And re-watching the Raimi films, I do find a new appreciation for them, particularly with two. But maybe that's why this one intrigues me. It had the most impossible task of winning people over with a new Spider-Man reboot after a goofy but still iconic series. And all the changes in the film reflect that. Instead of going cheerful and clean, it went angry and dirty. Rather than Golden Age comic dialogue, it went more modern day comic dialogue. It brought back the writer of Ordinary People and allowed him to write a screenplay more like Ordinary People. The main character just happened to be a superhero. At the time, there were a lot of audiences that were happy to have a more grounded Spider-Man flick, especially with other comic book movies going that direction. But the hate boner erected quick and soon diehard fans declared if you liked anything in this, you were betraying the sanctity of the franchise. Now dig on. Clearly this was the one step too far. But I will admit, the same way I was asking people to see how I could find the originals too corny, shouldn't I also see how people could find this too safe? Yes, it's more real, but doesn't that suck out the uniqueness of Spider-Man going all in big like the comic did? I will always remember the iconic imagery from those films, and here I have... Lizard Voldemort and webbed dicks. <laughs> Whether you love it, hate it, or are somewhere in between, I find it intriguing because it begs the question of what should a comic book movie lean more towards? A comic book or a movie? Well, let's look at the first of these Mark Webb films to get an idea. This is the worst thing to ever happen to Spider-Man! So I'm told! This is Amazing Spider-Man. We start with a flashback of Peter Parker as a little boy, whose parents take hide and seek very seriously. Next, we're gonna play charades blindfolded. But it looks like somebody broke in, which means why don't you visit your Uncle Ben and Aunt May for the rest of your life? He doesn't like crust on his sandwiches. He likes to sleep with a little light on at night. He also likes to wear Spider-Man pajamas. Wait, what? Cut to years later as Peter, played now by Andrew Garfield, discovers his parents died in a plane crash and is now a geek guy, guess. <laughs> Morning, Flash. So on the one hand, I don't just want the same Peter Parker again, and they do give us something different. Garfield is more of a brain in the same way Jobs or Zuckerberg is a brain. It's less chess club and more debate, less dorky and more awkward. Girls will talk to him, but they won't date him. If he didn't become Spider-Man, he'd probably run some company that would take over the world. Similar to how if McGuire didn't become Spider-Man, he'd probably push people around. One would be a physical bully and the other would be an industry bully. So already, I like that it keeps the same ideas, but tweaks them enough to be different and new. So, why are you pretending he's high school George McFly then? Good morning, Parker. First off, he looks 29. That might be because he's 29. It would make more sense if they started this as an adult and he was already bitten by the spider. Second, what bully would pick on him? He's a good-looking skater with more hair gel than Everett from Oh Brother Where Art Thou if he was in a boy band. I mean, I get the idea he's not the bottom of the social food chain. That's reserved for... Even that kid doesn't seem that bad. Okay, the grandma's sweater's a little weird, but we had this for three movies. He's supposed to just be odd, particularly with him looking out for kids being bullied where others don't. Take the picture. Put him down, Eugene. <laughs> That's great, but it's inconsistent. He even takes out his contacts to put glasses on because his dad wore glasses, but let's be honest, it's done so we can identify him as the doofa dork from the previous films. He wore glasses? Parker! Uncle Ben, played well by Martin Sheen, has a similar problem. Even though he gives a really great performance, too many elements keep calling back to the original, even reworking the hammered in catchphrase. If you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. That's what's at stake here. Not choice, responsibility. From six words to 21 words. Abbreviate that next to what would Jesus do? But when the movie tries to be more its own thing, it is pretty engaging. Peter finds his father's old bag and looks up the scientist he used to work with on Bing, the search engine I use when I don't want someone to check my history because nobody would ever think of checking Bing, which leads him to Oscorp. Welcome to Oscorp. 
Born from the mind of our founder, Norman Osborn. Appearing here as a dark overlord because we haven't figured out how to ruin him yet. The Oscorp Tower houses 108 floors of innovation. We are especially excited about our evil lizard man division. Honestly, we don't care what we do here as long as the color green is involved. He comes across a girl in his class named Gwen Stacy, played by Emma Stone, who works with Dr. Connors, played by Reese Ifans. Crossing my fingers, I said that right. Damn it! I want to create a world without weakness. Doing a bang up job there. Gwen figures out quickly, though, that Peter is not supposed to be there. Following me? No, I'm not following. No, I'm not following you. No, I'm not. I had no idea you worked here. Then why would you be here? I just snuck in because I, I love science. So the romance between these two always seems to hover in between adorably likable and Jesus, stop the hang up first shit. Um, I, I was touching up stuff. You're touching up stuff. Come on. I was. I was. Uh, I'm not gonna answer that. Got your mom, please. Oh, love, lovely. Yeah, they were. They were nice. No, they're beautiful. I really like kissing you. You're an amazing kisser. <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was good for me too. You always just make it, but you're like that close. Peter finds himself in a room of spiders and, spoilers, he bites one of them. Ah. Oh, that's right, it's the other way around. Sorry, I see this scene done so rarely. This results in him having a strange reaction to Bums using his head as a coaster. I feel like a lot of people would have a strange reaction to that. Beer! Get your hand off her. Let's try it. Are you freaking kidding me? Who is this guy? He's upset someone's acting rude after he places a beer on someone's head, and somehow he riles everyone up to fight Peter. I wish the spider bit him. I want to see the crazy ass shit he would do. Despite that, I do love this fight because it's basically a comedy of errors. Every move is accidental, but works in Peter's favor. I love how he holds up his arm knowing it's pointless, like the coyote waving before he falls, but it actually works with his new powers. I'm so sorry. I learned self-defense on Bing, so like anything on there, if I succeeded, it's completely by accident. This causes him to get home late, upsetting Uncle Ben and Aunt May, played effectively by Sally Field. What? <laughs> Fly, Peter. Why does it feel weird to see Spider-Man acting like a Spider-Man? Bing! Bing will have my answers! Well, this will make other morning activities fun. Peter tries to get some answers from Dr. Connors and reveals that he's the son of his old partner, Richard Parker. We were gonna change the lives of millions. The problem was always... The K-rate algorithm? Let me go out on a limb. I mean, let me lend you a hand. I mean, I'd give my right arm if I could... Your arm is missing. Fuck, I'm so bad at this! Peter, through his father's research, figures out the algorithm to cross species with hopefully no side effect. Their side effects. The next day at school, banners are being painted on the basketball court while players practice. That seems like a sensible place to do it. Clearly, if anything goes wrong, it's the player's fault. You did that on purpose, Flash! I'm gonna continue this on the buzzsaw in shop class, where it's safe! No, but I should've. You better watch your back. That's right, teen girl half my size who looks like a threat. Flash is weird in this. Parker, of course, uses this opportunity to stick up for her, embarrassing the bull. <laughs> That's it! You're going to detention! And the basketball team practice starts at 7 a.m. sharp. So all this is about getting even. Ben balls Peter out for acting so insensitive and showing off moments before he acts insensitive and shows him off. He's got you on his computer. I'm his probation officer. Total creeper. He put your head on squirrel's bodies. He has all sorts of issues. After talking with Gwen, he tries out some of his new abilities in what I suppose is supposed to be a training montage, but honestly, it comes across more like a jeans commercial. <laughs> Peter tries the algorithm out with Connors once again, causing him to be late to pick up Aunt May. That's what's at stake here. Responsibility. Where's my dad? He didn't think it was his responsibility to be here to tell me this himself. I like that Peter and Ben's blow up seems more built up over time, unlike the original where he just kind of snaps out of nowhere. Both their performances feel very justified and believable. Yeah, of course, it doesn't help this, followed by a Curb Your Enthusiasm bit. You can leave a penny anytime. You have to spend $10 to take a penny. don't have two cents. You so can't afford you your didn't. milk. Just step aside. This is where he takes a baseball bat, starts smashing up all the items, and says, Too much! The guy behind Peter robs the place as Peter just watches. Hey, kids, little help. Not my policy. 
I missed the part where that's not my policy. Oh god, you see why you need to be your own thing? At least I'm sure they'll do something different with Uncle Ben. Yeah, okay. Tell Emilio I still know he exists. Someone call an ambulance, Uncle Ben! The police put a warrant out for the lead singer of Hanson, and Peter becomes completely obsessed with his dead father. I mean, completely obsessed with his dead uncle. He can have two dings. Not today, Flash. Hey, come on, man. I just want to talk. Feels <laughs> better, right? I'm sorry. I like that Flash sympathizes with him, again, giving the people in this world a little bit more dimension. But did they need to use that reality show gasp sound effect? Your own cookbook! <laughs> He stops criminals trying to find Uncle Ben's killer, realizing he's gonna need to hide his identity. Oh my god, I was just attacked by El Cruzado! You thought that camera angle would make him look less silly. He crafts his web slingers, practices swinging around, and eventually perfects his Spider-Man costume. Perfects is a... Kind word. Hey, M.A. Yeah, eggs? Organic, got it. Yeah, let's use the real voice he would have with that mask on. <laughs> Yet he still mumbles less than McGuire. Here's the thing, while Garfield is not the young Peter Parker the comics portrayed, I would argue he's more the Spider-Man the comics portrayed. Spider-Man was a jokester, had good one-liners, and could be confident to the point of being almost a jerk. I feel like that's more what we got here, as he's legit pretty funny. Use the window, get out the window. There you go, you got it. I just did 80% of your job. You mother hubbard. You a cop? Really? I mean, what zingers did McGuire have? Here's your change! It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. One-liners was not their specialty. It helps maintain the Except illusion. for him, that goes without saying. Knock it off, man. No, no. Spider prick, spider prick. Fucker will nail you in the dick. Aunt May becomes concerned, though, with Peter returning home with bruises. Who does this to you? I want to take karate, ma! Peter, secrets have a cost. They're not. Remember, if you can do good things for good people, you have a moral obligation to- Oh Christ, how did it go again? Cross species genetics is finally working. Dr. Connors is making progress with his experiments, but Oscorp tells him he has to move forward with human trials, as apparently, Norman Osborn's life depends on it. I've used lizard DNA to help Freddy regrow that limb. It's a miracle. He's catching flies with his tongue, but aside from that, he's doing great. He shut down, though, because he can't do human trials fast enough, so naturally, he experiments on himself. Meanwhile, Peter is invited to Gwen's house for dinner, where he discovers his latest enemy, a police captain who wants Spider-Man arrested, played by Dennis Leary, is his girlfriend's father. Hmm, we'll just steal that for homecoming. There we go. Did you catch that spider guy yet? He's an amateur, assaulting civilians. I, th I think most people would say that he was providing a public service. Most people would be wrong. It's not even accurate, Batman blows it. He probably saved thousands in property damage alone. I like Peter has to really face off with the pros and cons of being a vigilante, as he ruins a case for the cops following a car thief to bigger criminals. But he turned him into quickly, not knowing. I also like it only takes one movie to reveal to his girlfriend who he really is. And I'm not gonna lie, it's a pretty hot reveal. Do me. Of course, Connor's experiment goes awry, and he starts transforming into the Lizard, a monster who throws cars off a bridge and are webbed off screen. Forgot to schedule a talk with your editor there. Somebody help! Help me, my kid is trapped! And that Lizard should really have a snout! I mean, I know it's an epic, but look at him! He looks weird! Help! Help! Hey, look. Just a normal guy. With that said, if you tell anyone who I am, I'll kill you. Normal guy, but I will kill you. Jack. Oh, God. I enjoy that around this point, his quest becomes less about revenge, looking for Uncle Ben's killer, and more about helping others. Which, as far as I know, transitioning from revenge to crime fighting is not part of the Spider-Man origin, but I kinda like it. It adds an extra layer. But things heat up when Parker goes to Connors and discovers his toy lightsaber is transforming him into the lizard. And even that healed up rat is having a few issues. Narf. No 
company believes Parker that the lizard is real, so he tries getting a picture for proof, locating him in the sewers. Did you know that you can save 15% or more on car insurance? Well, that's ironic. Down came the rain and washed me out. Peter gets away, but in easily the dumbest scene in the movie, he leaves his name on the camera. Major genius, my ass. That's like Clark Kent taking his Superman outfit to be dry cleaned. After a funny and even touching moment where Gwen helps mend Peter, Connors goes more and more crazy, tracking Peter down to his school. Sir, you need a hall pass. The fight scene is fun and leads to one of my favorite Stan Lee cameos, as well as something I bet you never thought you'd see in a Spider-Man film up to this point. A girl do something. Gwen. Oh, come on. Clearly you should be falling off a building or hanging onto something. That's both. Okay, I'm impressed. The lizard gets away and we see something else I bet you never thought you'd see in a Spider-Man movie back then. The police kicking ass. Well, how about that, man? We may get a policeman comic coming soon. Ah, no, shit, we still suck. He releases a gas, turning the cops into lizards as he believes that will create a stronger race. Gwen starts working on an antidote while the cops knock out Spider-Man in their search for the lizard. Uh, taking off my mask? Oh shit, they are. Okay, you die, you die, you die. All of you die. Parker, it's headed to Oscorp, and your daughter's there right now. He convinces the police captain to let him go in yet another attempt to recreate the first one. A bunch of New Yorkers band together. At least the crane operators, which there are a lot of, conveniently all on this long stretch. Who helps Spider-Man swing towards the lizard? Yeah! You mess with Spidey, you mess with New York! Oh, uh, we don't have to say that this time. Oh, thank God! Oh no, looks like Gwen's gonna be the damsel in distress. Clearly everything was better in the other films. <laughs> That's just good writing. Granted, he did still get the device he needed to turn everyone to lizard people, but she tells her dad what's going on. I don't understand! I do. Your boyfriend is a man of many masks. I get it. We're both written as competent in this. It'll take a little getting used to, but I think it's a good thing. As you'd imagine, fighting the lizard is a difficult task, even for the web-slinger. Poor Peter Parker. Pick the peck of pickle peppers. I know, but it's so funny! It's not alone. Thank God I arrived with no backup. I mean, maybe he radioed them in and they're on their way, but time was of the essence, so he had to head up there early. I just want to believe in smart cops in movies! The captain is hurt, but Parker turns Connor's back and they stop the... Lizard bomb from going off. I was wrong about you, Peter. The city needs you. You're gonna make enemies. McGuire fanboys, mostly. A guy that's been memed a million times? Don't try to understand it. Just promise I won't be a meme in the next movie. Um... I just guaranteed it'll happen, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Fucking internet. The captain dies, and Peter keeps his distance from Gwen, trying to honor his wishes. Oh, Christ, we have to go through yet another forced breakup we know isn't gonna last, and the characters are too stupid to figure it out. You made you promise, didn't they? Stay away from me. Okay, this is a comedy show? I have to hold on to some stupid characters here. I guess it does end on kind of a confusing note, as Gwen and Peter's relationship isn't the only thing pointlessly open-ended. We have the mystery of Peter's parents and the mystery of Uncle Ben's killer. Which isn't a mystery, it's this guy. What was even gonna be discovered with that? Oh my god, he's a singer for Nickelback! Now I hate him even more! Whatever life has in store for me, I will never forget these words. If you can do good things for other people, you have a moral obligation to do those things. That's what's at stake here, not choice responsibility. Just rolls right off the tongue. And that was The Amazing Spider-Man. Is it good? In my opinion, clearly yes. But, the previous films are more unique, iconic, and I can see why people would like them more. I get the feeling this film was chopped up a lot in editing, as when you watch the teaser, there's tons of breathtaking shots that make you feel like you're free-falling. And in the film, we get bits of that, but not for very long. 
The reason I bring that up is had the film utilized more of those long shots and some of the more colorful sequences, I think we could have had one of the great Spider-Man flicks. It would have helped give it more of an identity. As is, its strength is in its performances and its dialogue as I really like these characters and want to see them in more good movies. I think Garfield is a great Spider-Man, and while not an authentic young Peter Parker, he is still an interesting young Peter Parker. Remember, he does evolve in the comics from a dweeby teen boy to a strong, confident man. And I just get that latter half much more from Garfield than I do Maguire. If somehow we could have Maguire as young Peter Parker and Garfield as older Peter Parker, I think we'd have a perfect combo there. For a while, this was the Spider-Man movie that was more my speed. I dug the realistic conversations over the Adam West-style dialogue, but I do see now this is a bit more run-of-the-mill. I will never forget what happens in the Raimi films where with Webb, I remember more of the feelings in the moment, but not a ton else. I don't think the strengths of the film should be pushed aside, though. The acting is good, the dialogue feels real, the web-slinging scenes, when they hold on them long enough, really make you feel like you're swinging through the air. After all the other superhero films and even Spider-Man films that came out after this, I can definitely see why some couldn't get on board with this flick. But it's still worth acknowledging what worked in it, especially knowing the time frame and limitations they had to work with. Is it amazing? I guess not. But in my opinion, it's still a decent Spider-Man. And that's the end of March, so that's the end of Spider-Man. Thank you all so much for watching. I mean, I guess I could go one day more, but it had to be like something really special. I mean, something really big. <laughs> it, it had to be the absolute worst Spider-Man movie ever made. The review for the worst Spider-Man movie ever made has been canceled. I'm sure you understand. Please enjoy this replacement as your feature presentation. Oh, hi, MC fans. We got the results of the test back. You definitely have April Fools. While a few things will be different for the time being, it's business as usual with a new nostalgia critic every week. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy the end of Spider Month. I love this job. Thank God we're done with spider months. Doing this song has really sucked ass. Did we ever run even once? Nope, just own it and be a dunce. Oh, fuck. Let's never do this again. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it? What the hell just happened? <laughs> I've done it! Doc Ock? I've crossed dimensions to finally get my revenge on Spider-Man. Well, that's not cool. You messed up my location! Do you know how crazy people get if that backdrop changes? Silence! Okay. According to my calculations, Spider-Man should be in the corner of your office right now. Ha! Wrong there, Doc Schlock! Oh wait, he's just a hint over. Oh, yeah, that checks out. Perfect! Torture him with all your might! Dude, I'm not doing that! I have a review to film and get in the way! Yeah! Just do your review exactly as planned! What? Why would that torture him? Because I could never capture the actual Spider-Man, so I just made a humanized version of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. What? He's the humanized version of Amazing Spider-Man 2? We're gonna have so many sequels! This will be the best start to a cinematic universe yet! Oh, now I get it. Hats off, this is very evil. I know. Just review the film normally and I'll finally have my revenge on Spider-Man. You mean the humanized version of The Amazing Spider-Man 2? That's 15 syllables. Spider-Man, that's three. So much easier. I didn't think of it that way, I'm sorry. I accept your apology. After that, can you put my universe back the way it was? <laughs> we'll see what happens. Oh, right. We'll see what happens. So, I'm a big hit, right? Everybody loves me? Sit down. I am sitting down. Sit down in a more depressing way. That'll do. <laughs> After
after the respectable success of Amazing Spider-Man, it seemed like Sony had a reboot that could possibly get some traction. So, what did they do? What every idiot studio at the time did, they tried creating a cinematic universe! 2014's Amazing Spider-Man 2 was supposed to be the start of several spin-off movies as well as at least two more sequels. This meant they didn't need those pesky writers who combine social stress and psychological pain with epically fantastic elements. That's not what Spider-Man is, stupid! No, no. Bring in the dicks who did the Transformer films, Legend of Zorro, and nail their own cinematic universe with The Mummy. And let me tell you, this feels like a script from the dicks who did the Transformer films, The Legend of Zorro, and Dark Universes Part 1 of 1. While Spider-Man 3 certainly did a lot of wrong, it at least felt contained in the same universe as the other two. This one feels like five different styles from five different movies, and none of them I want to see have a cinematic universe. So, how could a more gritty and down-to-earth Spider-Man go to the only Spider-Man movie to get a rotten score on Rotten Tomatoes? The, the only one to get a rotten score? Yeah, but that's just from people who like movies. That doesn't help. Okay, it's from people who hate movies. That's somehow worse. Okay, just shut up, do as I say, and we'll get through this, alright? Hey, that's what we were told every day on set. Let's wrap up Spider-Month with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. The film opens with Peter's parents leaving him with his aunt and uncle after their house is broken into. Oh, sorry, that was the first movie. Let me try this again. <clears throat> the film opens with Peter's parents leaving him with his aunt and uncle after their house is broken into. Yeah, we kinda already know this. Next, you're gonna remind us that they died in a plane crash. <laughs> you yeah, have 80 million subplots in this. We don't need a- Previously on Spider-Man. I mean, did it go without saying they were murdered and didn't die in an accident? Although, given their response time, maybe it was just incompetence. We're gonna be alright, okay? You see me? Nice warning, honey! Up behind you would have been nice! Haha, <laughs> too late! The shitty script's uploaded! They're gonna make a movie out of this turd! After that wasted seven minutes, which doesn't sound too bad, but trust me, you'll wish they used it more wisely. We see Spider Man, played again by Andrew Garfield, giving some pretty kick ass swinging scenes. <laughs> I'm glad they finally hold on these shots long enough as it's the closest I've ever felt in any of these movies to feeling like I'm swinging in the air. They're really well done and deserve a lot of attention. The film also appears to be more colorful and lively compared to the last one, with a new good looking spider suit, plenty of bright imagery, and a pretty fun action sequence stopping the rhino, played by a completely wasted Paul Giamatti. No, not just underutilized, I think he was legit wasted. <laughs> There was a tasting last night, yes. Who's robbing precious cargo? Hey, my name is Spider-Man. You can call me Webhead. You can call me Amazing. <laughs> Not a shaker. Well, this is a legit funny moment. Let's cut to all the lives he could have saved if he wasn't doing his comedy store routine. <laughs> well, liners are fine, but save people first. Heads up, watch out. Eh, not that one. You can put him back. You all right? Just Spider-Man. This is Max Dillon, played by Jamie Foxx. He's a nobody. I'm aware of this because he verbally clarifies he's a nobody. I'm a nobody. You're somebody. Well, that villain's set up, let's go to another subplot. Disappointing ghost memes. That's not the only distraction. We have Gwen Stacy, played again by Emma Stone, in a strange montage giving a graduation speech about bad foreshadowing. I know we all think that we're immortal. What makes life valuable is that it ends. So don't waste it living someone else's life. I guess what I'm saying is that burial site over there looks really nice. Back to me being alive! Cause even if we fall short... Hey, too soon. What better way is there to live? Spider-Man stops the rhino, or... whatever he's doing to him here. I am This is not him! You know his frown flipped as a perfect Joker smile? All joy will dim when he leaves acting. And he makes it just in time for graduation. Aunt May, played again by Sally Field, congratulates Peter, but the guy known for giving long-winded rants has kept silent again with his disapproving look. I feel like every look Garfield gives in this movie is his first reaction to a Tobey Maguire meme. Okay, I promise that's the last Maguire meme joke. No, I don't. We get the classic will-they-won't-they they stuff between Peter and Gwen, which, if this was the other films I would hate, but these two not only talk honestly about what they're going through so they can figure out their problems like smart people. It's my father, isn't it? I promised him that I would keep away from you. How can I do this? What, is that, what does this make me? 
but they also have legit chemistry, maybe because they were dating in real life when this was being filmed. Also, Mark Webb did romances before doing these movies, so it kind of makes sense that these would be done well. Even if they do kind of distract from essential movie plot points. I can't lose you too. It's because you can't lose me. We can't be together. Hey, remember Uncle Ben? Maybe I should find his killer. Nah, let's do this Edward Enigma thing instead. Spidey. But is someone celebrating a birthday today? That's why you're here. You remember my birthday. I like to thank the Academy for forgetting about this performance. Yeah, Jimmy Fox is a great actor and comedian, but this film highlights neither of those. He's just every obsessed geek character you've seen in a million movies. Nothing about him stands out because there's not enough time to give him anything that stands out. You know, Spider-Man saved my life one time. He said he needed me. I gotta tell Peter not to save everyone. Sometimes if a truck is heading towards him, let nature take its course. We're introduced to Dane DeHaan as Harry Osborn, because we're a half hour in and we still don't have all our main players yet, who's visiting his father Norman, played by Chris Cooper, because he heard Giamatti was embarrassingly sidelined, so he figured get in on the action too. Retroviral hyperplasia. This is not how I imagined I would die. Yeah, did they ever find a cure for green goblinitis? Funny how he's only in this film a minute and I already wish he was the one flying around on the glider instead of this pipsqueak. But to his credit, Dane DeHaan is one of those actors who both gets worse and better the more you watch him. He's another one of those actors that nobody really talks like. What was dad thinking? I don't know how. That is the Osborne way. And I don't know why. Fairy godmother. I need his blood. Hi. He's a hybrid of Leonardo DiCaprio, Keanu Reeves, and every Culkin child known to man. I kind of love him the more I watch him. You're a fraud, Spider-Man! It gets even better when Peter consoles Harry after his father dies. Yeah, didn't you know they're like the oldest of friends, even though he was never mentioned in the first film. He's so in the dark about this Oscorp place, even though he knew the son of the owner of it. Dah, he just forgot about it. It's like living in Chicago, but never visiting the Sears Tower, and it's a person. And it gets even better. Just watch these two together. DeHaan's acting style is so different from Garfield's that they have extreme chemistry and no chemistry at the same time. It's kind of fascinating. And then Europe, you know? I went to Europe. I saw you. You got a lady? That's a question. Uh, what's her name? Who is she? It's complicated. Yeah, I don't do complicated. Honestly, it's like Sam Raimi came in just to direct his scenes alone. <laughs> Dude, that whole model thing is so exhausting. I know. Now, this is embarrassing, but I once wrote you a play in high school. <laughs> it doesn't match anything else. It's always odd, but it's always entertaining. So you're not that let down by the movie yet, right? I mean, the romance is good, the action is cool, and even Spider-Man has some touching scenes. This is a wind turbine. You make this? It's good as new, right? I'll walk you home. What's your name? Warning. I guess I did kind of forget some of the legit fun scenes in this movie. See? You don't have to focus on Max falling into a bunch of eels, getting electric powers and convenient dental work. Oh yeah, this dumb shit! Yeah, everyone remembers this dumb shit. Max comes back to life from being electrocuted in an experiment, which tone-wise matches perfectly with this next scene. <laughs> It's like a TV monster movie went to commercial for a dating app. We'll return to the TNT movie right after this. I didn't think I could meet anyone, but then Web Together introduced me to a girl I could really fall for. Well, she fell for me, but I'm getting too technical. Th my laugh that is laugh off the is table. Off the you, got, you gotta figure out a more annoying laugh. <laughs> Still adorable. <laughs> yeah, all right. Even though I praised the hell out of these two, let's talk about some of their legit problems. You see, everything in the movie is always moving 20 things forward. So when you have a romance where they just kind of chat about random stuff, completely different from everything else in the film, you do start to feel like a third wheel watching them. No more of this little nose rub do you do. This? Don't think I have a day. What am I supposed to do? It's allergy season. You're just spitting in the face of my ground rules. I'm out. Oh god, just bang already. Max is transformed into Electro, who I have to say looks nothing like the comic, but does look pretty damn cool. On the no, stop! Don't do that! 
Get down on the ground into the gas! Why is that so hard to understand? <sighs> Even his reason for being evil is very basic bitch motivated. <laughs> Spider-Man tries to talk him down before fighting him. Again, I really feel like Garfield nailed the comedic, but still caring elements that made Spider-Man such a great hero. Minus that count. And even though this line makes no sense, I still get a laugh out of it. What's your name again? How could you forget me? I know it, don't tell me. It's Max. Is it Max? Yes. Again, I don't know what way that was intended to be funny, but it is funny. <laughs> We get another inventive and colorful action sequence as Spider-Man knocks Electro out and his ratings go up. What the hell does that mean? It means this movie isn't as bad as you're saying. Sure, there's a few hiccups here and there, but every Spider-Man movie has that. I'm gonna be okay. So is he destroyed yet? Hey, his soul doesn't look demolished. It's okay, it's okay. We're only halfway through the movie. Oh, you're only halfway through. Got it. You scared me for a second. Carry on. Do things get better halfway? It's a complicated question. Well, that gives me hope. But with a simple answer, no, it does not. Aww. So not only does Peter discover Gwen is moving away to England, and he becomes obsessed with finding out what happened to his parents again, while also looking for Uncle Ben's killer way, no, still nothing. But Harry discovers he's dying of the same disease as his father. This dialogue just flows. You yeah, alright? Not really, Pete. I'm dying. But I think you can help save my life. He said that like he ran out of Fritos! I'm out. Pick some up. And I'm dying. But don't forget Fritos. I love Fritos, and I'm dying, but Fritos, and I'm dying. Harry says he thinks Spider-Man's blood can cure him as he can self-heal. Is that why he was getting cough medicine earlier? <laughs> you know him. What? You took his picture. All oh, right, that's still a thing. They literally text us J. Jonah Jameson's cameo. I can't believe I forgot. Gwen discovers they're trying to keep Max's connection to Oscorp a secret and hides from security, trying to track her down. This is the maintenance closet. This is the most cliched hiding place. This oh, is, I'm this sorry. is the stupidest hiding I didn't place. Take us to the Bahamas listen, of hiding places. Listen, I'm listen. so glad I introduced you to. Peter provides a pretty funny diversion for Gwen to escape, and we see where they're keeping Max. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! Actually, are you sure we're not in that movie right now? I'm here to study you, to understand what you are. See, here's the thing. This whole German mad scientist torturing Dr. Nightcrawler Manhattan here, I'd be fine with in a Spider-Man movie. If the whole movie was like this. You want to go for the crazy Guillermo del Toro, Terry Gilliam thing? Have at it. But this doesn't match with this doesn't match with this and each one is bringing a full script's worth of content to the table. Even when a scene does take its time, you're so jolted by the fast pace of everything else, you can't get comfortable with it. Meaning, you're less likely to let a scene sit with you. Like this one, for example, when he's talking to Aunt May. The truth is, your parents left you here on our doorstep. Your Uncle Ben and, and I. Uncle who? Oh yeah, I will find his killer, or not. I was the one, me, who has to take nursing classes with 22-year-old kids so I can pay for you to go to college, and I don't know how to do this. This emotional moment seems like a good time to work in that spy stuff again. Two government men came to see us. The genetics research that your father was doing with Norman Osborn was very valuable. See what I mean? These just don't go. It's like in Godfather if he was like, Look how they massacred my boy. By the way, the secret government information that spies might be asking you about, don't ever let them find the microchip. My boy! Later, Spider-Man drops by Harry's home to talk about using his blood to cure him. You talk to Peter? Yeah. I want to help you, Mr. Osborne. I really, really do. Now, Harry has no idea that this is Peter, but honestly, how couldn't he? Everything from his voice to his demeanor to how he holds himself? You can practically see his face that always looks like he just read a mean tweet from a Maguire fan. What kind of geniuses are you two supposed to be? All right, how much? Name it. You want a boat? You want a plane? Hmm, a spider plane does sound cool. 
Your blood can't make me die more. But it could do something worse. Peter says he won't give Harry the blood because it'll either kill him or make him too powerful. This makes no fucking sense. Okay, here's my theory. There's a later scene where Peter finds out his father's blood is the key to making a lot of these experiments work. And his father did this because he found out Oscorp couldn't be trusted as they wanted to weaponize what he was working on. I think that scene was originally written to go before this scene. Because it would give Peter a reason not to trust Oscorp and the son of the man who wanted to weaponize his father's work. But with those scenes in the order that they are, he just looks like a dick! Does he not trust Harry? He hasn't done anything to not earn his trust. And even if he did grow powerful, just keep him on the right path like he was your best friend. Say, that reminds me, you're best friends, aren't you? You're gonna let your best friend die because of, honestly, a lot of solutions to minor problems? So much of the goodwill built up in these previous scenes is being obliterated over not just a stupid choice, but a cruel choice. As the film continues, the bad scenes start to erase the good scenes that came before it. As, looky here, another villain is introduced. Yeah, not enough to make it on the poster, but he's a villain. Apparently, this guy makes it look like Harry hid Max and fires him from his duties. But it's cool, Felicia Hardy, oh yeah, Black Hat is in this, tells Harry about their secret lab below. Hey, gotta justify her in this somehow for that spin-off movie that's never gonna happen. Before they destroyed the spiders, they had the venom extracted. Where is it? Somewhere in the building. I know, because my father designed this building. Did you know a firecracker down the garbage chute will blow this place up? Peter also discovers a secret lab for himself. His father had an Oscorp location in an abandoned subway that... Oh, I guess Oscorp just forgot about! Unless his dad put that all together, which look at that fucking thing, no! And he discovers, like I said before, that Oscorp wanted to weaponize his experiments. Destined to find a cure, Harry frees Electro, saying he needs him. He zaps the guards and electricity some shorts, joining Harry's side. Remember me? Weirdly, no. Electro puts together, let's be honest, a fucking weak-ass suit. You look like the Fantastic Four member they hide behind Thing. And they force the new head of Oscorp to show him where the possible cure might be, while Electro goes to kill Spider-Man. What is all this stuff? The future. Well, we know that's not true. He takes the cure made from the venom of the Oscorp spiders. Oh, now I get how that was going to tie in. <laughs> Very clever. But as predicted, it has some side effects, giving even less of a fuck about your performance being one of them. You're making me hammy. You wouldn't like me when I'm hammy. Peter wastes the city's entire budget on bridge maintenance just to let Gwen know that despite her leaving, he still loves her. Spider-Man kidnapped that woman! He also lets her know that he's going to move to England with her. Boy, not much wind on those New York bridges, huh? I'm just gonna follow you everywhere. I'm just gonna follow you the rest of my life. Or, rest of your life would be more practical. I have an entire file of these jokes. The power goes out all over the city, but Peter and Gwen have an idea how to bring it back, while also stopping Electric Andros. Yeah, the rivalry has been so built up. What was his motivation again? I want to get that job! <laughs> oh, and get this. Two planes are about to crash into each other if the power's not turned back on. But literally nobody in the movie knows this, so it adds no extra tension. None of the main characters are on there, and we know it's not gonna crash. It honestly feels like it was added at the last minute because the climax wasn't exciting enough. With that said, this climax isn't exciting enough. The CG is not particularly impressive, especially compared to earlier. The shots and action are pretty standard. And then, you know, this dumb shit. Down came the goblin and took the spider out. Spider-Man! Bet you never saw this guy. Again, great electro writing. What other great quips did he have? Die, Spider-Man, or I got you now, or... Die, Spider-Man. At this point, I think I would prefer you're the one who's out gobby out of your mind. At least I'd remember it. <laughs> when shows up, Leary gives the audience's facial reaction, and the two of them finally defeat Electro. Oh, and the two planes were saved, because I know that was at the height of your worries. See, that wasn't so bad. A little underwhelming and crowded, but it wasn't anything that bad. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Don't do this. 
Go back, go back, stay out of this movie! Oh, God. Oh, God, indeed. Not since Mila Kunis as the Wicked Witch, Rosie O'Donnell as Betty Rubble, or Vince Vaughn as Norman Bates has a famous character ever looked so... not right. You were my friend, and you betrayed me! Sometimes something can be so stupid it's funny. This is just so stupid it's stupid. Look at me! There's less than 20 minutes of the movie left, and another villain has been thrown into the mix. Arguably, Spider-Man's most famous villain, and he gets one-ninth of the movie to shine. Oh no. This is bad. This is very bad. Spider-Man fights Harry, slowly turning into Mr. Bean, but Gwen gets tossed, and Spider-Man's web... hand tries to catch her. As fans of the comic have deduced, and movie fans are tired of having hammered in, Spider-Man is unable to save her, and she dies. No, please, please. Please. So, cool, they got one of the biggest deaths in comic book history finally on the big screen. So why does it feel so empty? I don't want to see her go, I like seeing her and Peter interact but somehow this just doesn't feel warranted. Why? A couple reasons. First off, in the comic, this happened over a long-building rivalry. When Joker killed Robin in, god, any version of Batman, it's not done by a villain who just popped up. It's done by one who's been established for some time. It's a rivalry burning and burning and burning, and this was the final explosion it amounted to. Not, by the way, I'm the Green Goblin, what? Well, hey! Second, aside from that sloppy speech in the intro, the movie doesn't really support this happening either. Take Star Trek II. What's it about? It's about getting older but holding on to your youth. Sacrificing to stay alive but facing the inevitability of death. Some things you can escape, others you can't. All these themes are spread out throughout the movie, so it makes sense when a main character dies in it. What's Amazing Spider-Man 2 about? Um, parent spies, gliders that millionaires shouldn't know how to use, rhino people, Navi nightlights. It's too cluttered to be about anything! The only other way it could work is if they did it to be more realistic, like Godfather or Game of Thrones. You know, the shock value adds to the realism. And I don't think this is a series that rides that much on that anymore. The tragedy is this is the second time a Spider-Man movie has botched this scenario, which means we're never gonna see this done correctly on the big screen because everyone's just too familiar with it. So, one of the most famous comic book deaths in history is just gonna have to stay in comic book history. Because it's forever ruined anywhere else. Wow. Wow. Yes! Oh that's it! Oh Squish him like oh a God. clump oh of God. wet Play-Doh! Oh oh really, God. that's the best squishing oh analogy you could come up with oh in this God. scenario? Oh God, this can't be happening! Uh, don't worry, it gets better! Really? No? <laughs> Months go by as Peter is too scarred to fight crime and the masked figure from the ending of the first film- Oh shit, I forgot there's a masked figure at the end of the first film. We never find out who he is, it doesn't matter. Teams up with Harry and uses the weapons down below to form the sinister one and a half. I just so I kill you! I destroy you! Giamatti did think he was playing Gru in this, right? This is all just another bizarre minion spin-off? Under fire! Ooh, Giamatti! the man is a bad. You are much shorter than I remember! I knew you'd come back. Yeah, thanks for stepping up for me. Looks like you got this, so I'll be taking off. He attacks the rhino, and the rest is to be finished off another never. What? There's never another one? Nope. Amazing Spider-Man 2 was not really that amazing in a lot of people's eyes. The film by no means bombed, but it didn't make the money it was hoping for. Because of this, all future spin-offs and sequels were scrapped, and Sony finally made a deal to share the character with Disney. But this was supposed to be the big one, the trailblazer that launched a million universes. You got Tom Hardy burping in Venom. Nah, but I hate it. All right, so is this the worst Spider-Man movie? In my opinion, yes. Say what you want about three, but it had themes and ideas, and it committed all the way to them. It just wasn't very good at doing it and got too crowded. This one also got too crowded, also wasn't good at conveying its ideas, but on top of that, it felt like a bad commercial for movies that didn't even exist yet. 
Ironically, it repeated a lot of the same mistakes as 3, except it didn't have that strange, unique voice to help it stand out. Because of this, we get a film that's not only crowded and confused, but also bland, forgettable, and at times, pretty boring. Does that make it one of the worst movies ever made? No. Honestly, I wouldn't even call it one of the worst comic book movies ever made. It has some cool action and good acting, but you always know where its loyalty lies, to franchising. You can franchise a series fine, but you have to be committed to a good story and ideas first. And those simply aren't in this one. It's too bad. I really like Garfield as Spider-Man and would like to have seen where the series would have gone if they had gotten more competent writers behind it. As well as a studio that focused more on getting one film right instead of the next five. So, despite it giving some good scenes, Amazing Spider-Man 2 still remains, in my opinion, the worst Spider-Man movie ever made. Ah, oh god! Oh well done, Nostalgia Critic. You've ruined Spider-Man forever! You mean the humanized version of the Amazing Spider-Man? Uh, three syllables. Right. Now to ruin other versions of Spider-Man. I wonder if I can cast Jared Leto in anything. So long, plebeians! <laughs> oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. This can't be happening. Oh god. It's all over. It's all over! Oh, come on. It's not all over. Yes, it is. Everything's gone to shit, and I'm never going to get things back to normal. Nothing will ever be the same. Well, yeah. I mean, you're right. This will be a painful hit for you, and it'll affect more than you're probably aware. In fact, chances are you won't come out of this the same as when you went in. Are you trying to motivate me because you suck balls at it? Well, I'm trying to be realistic. Oh, good. That's just what I need now. You do! Because the truth is... You've been through worse. I mean, your history is filled with huge wins and great losses. And every time it looked like you weren't going to make it, you found another avenue to thrive in. Sometimes you had to stay out of the public eye for a while, but like anything special, people never forgot you. And in time, you'll learn how to grow something special within your limitations. Occasionally, even more special. Whenever it looked like every pathway was closed off, you found a way to slither through and become stronger on the other end. So yeah, you're gonna be out of commission. It's not fair and it's gonna suck. A lot. But you always find a way to get through it. You always find the will to be strong and inspire other people to be strong in the process. No matter what avenue you need to take. And you know why? Why? Because you're fucking awesome. I'm fucking awesome? And you remind people how fucking awesome they are. And fucking awesome feeds off of fucking awesome until there's so much fucking awesome in the world we don't know what to do with it. So you're gonna give up? Or are you going to continue to inspire that awesome? I'm a perpetual awesome machine! Damn right you are! You may be down and out for a bit, but nothing can take away your goddamn awesomeness! Yeah! 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 We do know what we're really talking about, right? Of course. We're talking about motherfucking Spider-Man. Motherfucking Spider-Man! Motherfucking Spider-Man. So, what do we do now? Ooh! I haven't finished up Punisher yet. Eh, I never got into those Marvel shows. What am I supposed to say to that?